Ladies and gentlemen, good morning from the Stockton Center for International Law at the US Naval War College, and indeed good afternoon and good evening from wherever you are in the world. Uh, I'd like to welcome back those who joined us yesterday and indeed welcome those who were unable to. Uh, before we begin the conference in earnest today, just a few announcements. The first is to reiterate that yesterday, today and tomorrow, so all three days of the conference will be recorded and be made available to the public via, uh, via YouTube. The second thing is to encourage questions. So you'll notice uh, at the bottom of your screen there is a Q&A box. Uh, please post your questions there to our panelists um, as they come to you during their presentations. There's also a like feature there. So if you particularly like a question that someone else has posed and you want the moderator to see that ahead of other questions, uh, please use the like function. Uh, and then finally, I'll post in the Q&A box the link to our website, and from there you can download the program for the conference where you can see the bios for all the speakers and, and panellists. So with that, I'd like to hand over to the Charles H. Stockton Professor of International Maritime Law and Chair of the Stockton Centre, Professor James Kraska. Thank you very much, Kieran. Thank you, everybody, for participating in day two of the Disruptive Technologies and International Law Conference at Stockton Center. It, this morning, it's our real honor and pleasure to be able to listen to Dr. Ray Schorndorf. He is Israel's Deputy Attorney General for International Law. And in that capacity, he's responsible for all aspects of interpretation and application of international law in Israel's legal system with respect to international litigation, as well as treaty negotiations and representation of the state of Israel in international affairs and international forums. He has also been the director of the Department of Special International Affairs within the state's attorney's office. And previously he was in the International Dispute Resolution Group at Devoy and Plimpton LLP and he has served in, uh, on a number of delegations of the State of Israel, including delegations for peace negotiations with Syria, Lebanon, Jordan, and the Palestinians, as well as for negotiations for the creation of the International Criminal Court. Dr. Schindorf earned a Doctor of Juridical Science, that's the PhD of equivalent of law in the United States, and from NYU University School of Law, and he also uh, earned and studied law and economics at Tel Aviv University. Dr. Schengdorf, thank you very much for participating in this conference. The floor is yours. Thank you, James. Good morning, uh, good morning, everyone. I would like to thank the organizers for the opportunity to speak at this prestigious event. The last time I participated in this conference was on a panel regarding the Gaza Flotilla, the Gaza Flotilla incident in 2010. I remember that Professor James Frasca, James, spoke on the issue of maritime blockade. It was a compelling presentation, and while I'm not sure I remember each and every detail of it, you must have known what, <laughs> what you were talking about, James, given your current position here at the Naval War College. In any event, it gives me great pleasure to be a part of this conference again as a keynote speaker, though I wish it could have been in person. I would like to present here today Israel's perspective on key aspects of the application of international law in connection with cyber operations, with a particular emphasis on issues related to the use of force and armed conflicts. The question of how international law adapts to emerging technologies is one of the most challenging faced by legal advisors. These challenges compel us to revisit notions that have been with us for decades and sometimes centuries. We can see this in the fields of artificial intelligence, blockchain, and of course, in the context of cyber operations. Israel considers that international law is applicable to cyberspace. And this is a view that has become almost axiomatic for a vast majority of states. However, when seeking to apply particular legal rules to this domain, we're mindful of its unique features. These unique features shape policy 
and affect the legal framework applicable to the cyber domain. I wish to shortly address some of these. First, cyber operations are conducted through a global network passing through infrastructure located in, in multiple jurisdictions and lacks any meaningful physical manifestation. Second, much of the cyber infrastructure is held and controlled by the private sector and civilian components are a major part of the picture. Thus, regulation of the cyber domain may have various social and economic implications as well. Third, the cyber domain is highly dynamic given the fast pace of technological development and innovation. The development of international legal rules, on the other hand, is a more gradual process. This is understandable since these rules are designed to stand the test of time and are not easily amended. All these factors taken together suggest that an extra layer of caution must be exercised in determining how exactly international legal rules apply to cyber operations and in evaluating whether and how additional rules should be developed. We as government and military legal advisors are tasked with the role of identifying the relevant rules, including those set by the law of armed conflict and determining how they apply to a particular set of facts. In some cases, it will be possible to apply a certain rule as it is, while in other cases, the situation is conceptually different such that it might not be possible, feasible, or even desirable to draw from existing legal rules. This process obviously has to consider the behavior of states in the cyber domain as international law is state made. When dealing with a treaty provision, we look to the regular rules of treaty interpretation to ascertain the relevance and applicability of the provisions at hand in the cyber context. As for customary law, it is necessary to examine whether there is general state practice accepted as law substantiating the existence of a rule in the cyber domain. It cannot be automatically presumed that a customary rule applicable in any of the physical domains is also applicable to the cyber domain. The key question in identifying state practice is whether the practice is whether the practice which arose in other domains is closely related to the activity envisaged in the cyber domain. Additionally, it must be ascertained that the opinio juris which gave rise to the customary rules applicable in other domains was not domain specific. Given the unique characteristics of the cyber domain, such analysis is to be made with particular prudence as it is very often the case that relevant differences exist. Since it, this is the Naval War College Conference, it is only fitting that I will give an example from the law of maritime warfare. As you all know, the rules regulating maritime blockade evolved long ago. Over the years, these rules have crystallized into customary law. Nonetheless, this custom was formed specifically in the maritime context. Putting aside the question of whether the concept of blockade is relevant to cyberspace, the maritime practice is not closely related to any type of activity in the cyber domain. While the opinion juris in this regard, while the opinion juris in this regard is domain specific, it is therefore quite clear that the rules of maritime blockade are not applicable in the circumstances of activities in the cyber domain. The law of neutrality also illustrates the challenges of applying rules that evolved in the context of traditional warfare to the contemporary environment of cyberspace, as many of its rules were tailored specifically to the land, sea, and air domains. For example, in relation to one of the basic overarching rules of neutrality, the inviolability of a neutral state's territory, while in the land domain it is forbidden to transfer troops or convoys of munitions, at sea, the passage of warships in territorial waters is possible. And in the air, such passage is subject to discretion or limitations of each neutral state. Given these differences, it remains unclear if and how this rule would be applicable in cyberspace. 
These are just examples that show why it is not always easy to move from the general statement that international law applies to the cyber domain to concrete legal rules that bind states and non-state actors in their actual behavior. Accordingly, the State of Israel has largely refrained thus far from making specific statements on whether and how particular rules apply. That is not to say that we take no position. Indeed, we have consistently affirmed the application of international law to cyberspace in forums like the UNGGE and the Open-Ended Working Group. In parallel, over the last few years, we have been gradually formulating and developing our views on some contemporary issues relating to cyber operations. This is a meticulous and delicate process impelled by the need for thorough legal and practical research and careful consideration of a multitude of views together with an assessment of potential implications. Bearing, bearing in mind all these challenges, in my presentation today, I would like to share with you some of the insights that we have reached thus far regarding international law applicable to cyber operations, particularly in connection with armed conflicts. My hope is that this will contribute to the current legal discourse in this field. I will start by addressing a few key issues concerning the EU's ad bellum. First, and this has already been acknowledged by many others, the customary prohibition set out in Article 2.4 of the Charter of the United Nations on the threat or use of force in international relations is clearly applicable in the cyber domain. We share the support among states for the view that a cyber operation can amount to use of force if it is expected to cause physical damage, injury, or death, which would establish a use of force if caused by kinetic means. For example, hacking into the computers of the railroad network of another state and programming the controls in a manner that, it is, that, it, that is expected to cause a collision between trains can amount to a use of force. As with any legal assessment relating to the cyber domain, as practices in this field continues to evolve, there may be room to further examine whether operations not causing physical damage could also amount to use of force. Second, when the use of force in the cyber domain by either a state or non-state actor can be considered as an actual or imminent armed attack, the state under attack may act in accordance with its inherent right to self-defense as enshrined in Article 51 of the UN Charter. Of course, the exercise of this right is subject to the customary principles of necessity and proportionality. Finally, the use of force in accordance with the right of self-defense against an armed attack conducted through cyber means may be carried out by either cyber or kinetic means, just as the use of force in self-defense against a kinetic armed attack may be conducted by kinetic or cyber means. I would like to move on and address some key issues concerning the applicability of the law of armed conflict to the cyber domain. I will start by stating the obvious. The law of armed conflict and its fundamental principles generally apply to cyber operations conducted in the context of an armed conflict. Indeed, and I quote, the right of belligerents to adopt means of injuring the enemy is not unlimited, end quote, even in the cyber domain. Israel is a party to the four Geneva Conventions and other treaties governing particular aspects of conduct in armed conflict, and is also bound by applicable customary law. Israel, like the United States and others, is not a party to the additional protocols and is not bound by them as a matter of treaty law. However, we see the following as consistent with the relevant customary law and the additional protocols. One of the key issues in the conduct of hostilities in particular is how to define attacks and in which circumstances cyber operations amount to attacks under law. The concept of attack is central to targeting operations and only acts amounting to attacks are subject to the targeting rules relating to distinction, precautions, and proportionality. 
The definition of attack in LOAC requires several elements, but I will focus on those aspects carrying special relevance in the cyber context. Specifically, I will address the element requiring that an act will constitute an attack only if it is expected to cause death or injury to persons or physical damage to objects beyond the minimis. One aspect of this element concerns the reasonably expected consequences of the act in question. Reasonably expected consequences are those that are anticipated with some likelihood of occurrence and entail adequate causal proximity to the act. A second aspect in this element is the type of required damage. The requirement for physical damage has been accepted law since the introduction of the legal term of art attack into the LOAC discourse. For this reason, practices such as certain types of electronic warfare, psychological warfare, economic sanctions, seizure of property and detention have never been considered to be attacks as such and accordingly were not considered as subject to LOAC targeting rules. Only when a cyber operation is expected to cause physical damage will it satisfy this element of an attack under LOAC. In the same vein, the mere loss for impairment of functionality to infrastructure would be insufficient in this regard and no other specific rule to the contrary has evolved in the cyber domain. However, if an impediment to functionality is caused by physical damage, or when an act causing the loss of functionality is a link in a chain of the expected physical damage, that act may amount to an attack. For example, if a cyber operation is intended to shut down electricity in a military airfield, and as a result is expected to cause the crash of a military aircraft, that operation may constitute an attack, subject of course to the additional elements for attacks under law. The existence of physical damage is assessed purely on objective and technical grounds. It is a factual question and as such does not depend on the subjective perception or the manner in which the other side chooses to address the loss of the, or impairment of functionality. Finally, the fact that a cyber operation is not an attack does not mean that no legal limitations apply thereto. Indeed, there are general obligations in LOA that apply to all military operations, regardless of being attacks or not. Central among those is the requirement to consider the danger posed to the civilian population in the conduct of military operations. It is widely accepted today that parties to conflicts cannot blatantly disregard such harmful effects to the civilian population in their military operations. But there are also more specific protections that may apply to actions other than attacks. For example, cyber operations affecting medical units are regulated and limited inter alia by the LOAC obligation to respect and protect medical units which applies regardless of whether the act constitutes an attack or not. Moving on from the issue of attack, another question which is especially relevant to the cyber domain is whether the term object, as it is understood in LOAC, encompasses computer data. This bears implications with regard to the implementation of the LOAC rules relating to distinction, precautions, and proportionality. Objects for the purposes of LOAC have always been understood to be tangible things. And this understanding is not domain specific. It is therefore our position that under the law of armed conflict, as it currently stands, only tangible things can constitute objects. Here again, this does not mean that cyber operations adversely affecting computer data are unregulated. In particular, when an operation involving the deletion or alteration of computer data is still reasonably expected to cause physical damage to objects or persons and fulfills the other elements requires, required to constitute an attack, the operation would be subject to LOAC targeting rules. Likewise, one must have regard to rules which are not dependent, dependent on the concept of objects, such as the obligation to respect and protect medical units. Now, in addition to the use ad bellum and LOAC, there are other legal frameworks pertinent to cyber operations, 
that do not center around armed conflicts. Given their importance, I believe it is valuable to address them shortly and perhaps leave some room for further thoughts. I will start by addressing perhaps the broadest topic, which continues to be a subject of vibrant discussion, sovereignty. To begin with, there are diverging view regarding whether sovereignty is merely a principle from which legal rules are de derived or a binding rule of international law in itself, the violation of which could be considered an internationally wrongful act. This issue has many facets, and while I will not offer any definitive position for the time being, I would like to stress a number of important points. The first is that sovereignty is a cornerstone of international law and international relations. Of course, we need to distinguish in this regard between sovereignty, which is typically used as a general concept that connotes independence, and territorial sovereignty, which is an international legal rule. States will sometimes point to the need to protect their sovereignty, referring broadly to their political will and autonomy without necessarily referring to a legal rule. The two meanings are sometimes conflated and we need to be very careful when drawing legal conclusions. A second and related point is that states undoubtedly have sovereign interests in protecting cyber infrastructure and data located in their territory. However, States may also have legitimate sovereign, sovereign interests with respect to data outside their territory. For example, as governments store more and more of their data by using cloud services provided by third parties whose servers are located abroad, how do we, we describe the interest that they have in relation to that data? Would the interest in protecting the data not be a sovereign interest in this case as well? Or alternatively, when a state conducts a criminal investigation and needs to access data located abroad from its own territory, under what circumstances does it need to request the, cons the consent of the territorial state? Of course, there are no easy answers to these questions, and some of them are currently being discussed, discussed such, in, such as in the context of the protocol to the Budapest Cybercrime Convention currently being negotiated to address this very topic. These questions reflect an inherent tension between states legitimate interest and the concept of territorial sovereignty as we understand it in the physical world. In practice, states occasionally do conduct cyber activities that transit through and target networks and computers located in other states. For example, for national defense, cybersecurity, or law enforcement purposes. Under existing international law, it is not clear whether these types of actions are violations of the rule of territorial sovereignty, or perhaps that our understanding of territorial sovereignty in cyberspace is substantively different from its meaning in the physical world. Another matter closely related to the issue of sovereignty is that of non-intervention. Traditionally, this concept has been understood as having a high threshold. It has been taken to mean that state A cannot take actions to coerce state B in pursuing a course of action or refraining from a course of action in matters per pertaining to state B's core internal affairs, such as its economic or foreign policy choices. Its traditional application has focused on military intervention and support to armed groups seeking the overthrow of the regime in another state. This could presumably also relate to support given, given to armed groups in the cyber domain, such as providing information regarding cyber vulnerabilities of the state. A more recent issue that has come to the fore relates to, inter to interference in national elections. We concur with the various positions expressed in this regard, such as that which was presented by former State Department legal advisor, Ryan Egan, and more recently reiterated by DOGD General Counsel, Paul Ney, that, and I quote, a cyber operation by a state that interferes with another country's ability to hold an election or that manipulates another country's election results would be a clear violation of the rule of non-intervention, end quote. I will now turn 
into addressing three somewhat related topics, due diligence, attribution, and countermeasures. The concept of due diligence means that states should take reasonable measures to avoid or minimize harm to other states and seems to be useful in fields such as environmental law. In the 2015 UNGGE report, the concept was addressed as the basis for a voluntary, non-binding norm of responsible state behavior, providing that states should not allow their territory to be used for the commission of international wrongful acts. There was wisdom in mentioning it in the chapter covering norms of responsible state behavior, as it does not at this point in time translate into a binding rule of international law in the cyber context. This was the position expressed by other states as well. As I mentioned regarding the examples of maritime blockade and neutrality, we have to be careful in applying to the cyber domain rules that emerged in a different distinct context. For instance, in the field of environmental law, where much of the focus and application of due diligence obligation has been in recent years, the acting state typically has control or at least oversight over the harmful activity. For example, regulating a polluting power plant. However, cyberspace is mostly private and decentralized. The inherent different features of cyberspace its decentralization and private characteristics incentivize cooperation between states on a voluntary basis, such as with the case of national computer emergency response teams. Certs are already doing what could arguably fall into that category, exchanging information with one another, as well as cooperating with each other in mitigating incidents. However, we have not seen widespread spread state practice beyond this type of voluntary cooperation, and certainly not practice grounded in some overarching opinion juris, which would be indispensable for a customary rule of due diligence or something similar to that to form. The issue of attribution is also widely debated with respect to cyber operations. Some have suggested that there needs to be more legal certainty with respect to attribution in order to avoid mistaken attribution, which can lead to conflict escalation. This is increasingly becoming more of a theoretical issue. Over time, the attribution capabilities of states have improved, and even states with lesser capabilities have been able to rely on solid information provided by other states and by the private sector. In any event, this is a technical matter, a factual one, and I would advise against over-regulating the issue. That being said, there is also the question of public perceptions because sometimes when an offensive cyber operation is public and the attribution is public, the government needs to communicate with its citizens and with the international community at large in order for its positions and actions to be understood. But there will be cases when a state will prefer not to disclose the attack, the attribution, or any ensuing actions taken for diverse reasons, such as national security and foreign relations. Either way, as a matter of international law, the choice whether or not to disclose the attribution information remains at the exclusive discretion of the state. With respect to the issue of countermeasures, I would like to echo the positions taken by the UK, the US and other states to the effect that there is no absolute duty under international law to notify the responsible state in advance of a cyber countermeasure. Prior notification is perhaps more realistic and practical in fields such as international trade, allowing the responsible state to reconsider its actions without frustrating the ability of the injured state to take the intended countermeasures. However, in the cyber domain, where the pace of events can be extremely fast, and the other side may thwart the action if it anticipates it, announcing a cyber countermeasure in advance would often negate the utility and effectiveness, and in some instances, undermine the interests of the injured state, as well as render the countermeasure obsolete. One last point. I focused thus far on cyber operations, but it is important to keep in mind that the application of international law to cyberspace is much broader than the issue I touched upon. Questions relating to cybersecurity, cybercrime, digital trade, 
and human rights in the cyber domain are just a few examples. I think that international law has a crucial role to play in addressing these topics. By focusing on these topics, international law can contribute to enhancing global stability in a concrete way. We hope to share our views on these and other topics as well in due course. I wish to conclude my remarks by taking a step back. In the discussions that we're having on the application of international law in dealing with emerging technologies, I think that the challenges lie not in identifying the basic rules of international law, the prohibition on the use of force, self-defense, non-intervention, territorial sovereignty, etc., but in determining when and how they apply in new circumstances. Picture the land, air, and sea domains of international law as independent trees, each with its own branches and leaves, each yielding its own fruit. Each of these trees is sustained by common ingredients, soil, water, sunlight, yet each tree goes, grows differently, depending on the external conditions, the type of seed sown, and how the roots grow. We now have a new tree whose roots are just beginning to take shape. International law of cyber operations is a nascent field. It is emerging from the same grounds of international law, the same core principles at the heart of the international system and its leaves and fruit will bear some similarities to the other fields of law. But we do not expect that it will be identical once fully grown. So while the vast majority of states agree on the starting point of the application of international law to cyber operations, the international community is still very much at the beginning of the journey and the applicability of each existing rule of international law to the cyber domain requires careful assessment and review. Thank you again for inviting me to speak here today. I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Schindorf. That was obviously a wonderful presentation and very informative. And, and I think your tree uh, analogy was very interesting and very fitting. You know, I think we have we have two trees growing right now. We have obviously the, the the tech tree that has you know cyber and space and artificial intelligence, as well as the international law tree that's trying to grow to keep up with these technologies. And so I think that's a fantastic way to look at it. You know, you provided a very frank and practical um, approach, very frank, frank and practical comments regarding Israel's operational approach to the cyber domain. Could you perhaps share a little more on, you know, the reasons, kind of the background and considerations that have led to Israel's present views with respect to international law in the cyber domain? Certainly. Um, we, you know, we have been uh, thinking for quite a while uh, whether it would be appropriate uh, for us to make a, uh, to make a statement and make our views known with respect to uh, to our positions, uh, at least on some issues in the cyber context. Uh, and and for, for a long time, uh, we, we, we actually did spend a lot of time thinking uh, about these issues and trying to follow the practice and comments of uh, uh, other states. Uh, we do see a responsibility, uh, international law being state-made, uh, to participate in the process of uh, of uh, identifying and conceptualizing uh, the rules of international law, and and our uh, and our discussion of uh, or our presentation of these issues is intended to be part of the discourse and conversation that goes on. We felt at this point that uh, a substantial number of countries have uh, made uh, have already made presentations and. Uh, and when we got the invitation to speak uh, at this uh, prestigious conference, we thought, thought that might be a, an excellent uh, opportunity to make uh, our views more uh, public. Well, we certainly appreciate that. Um, and I know our audience does as well. Uh, if I could ask maybe a more specific question, Professor uh, Eric Jensen from BYU asks that you allow that it may be with respect to Article 2.4, practice may evolve in such a way that cyber operations not causing damage might amount to a use of force. Can you provide more details on what you mean? And he asked that, are you referring to economic operations? 
And if so, what standards might we start thinking about as the trigger for economic effects that amount to a use of force? Yeah, so, you know, I, I wouldn't, it's a tricky question. It's, a, it's an excellent question, of course. And I, I don't really want to use the, this platform to give uh, anybody any uh, ideas. I think that that the approach that we have taken, uh, that we are taking to identifying uh, uh, rules in the cyber domain, like many other states, is a cautious uh, approach. And and so we feel that at this point in time, uh, the safest uh, view would be uh, the safest view that is supported by state practice is that. Uh, uh, there needs to be a, a physical component to that. But we certainly see the possibility that in the future, uh, states may feel compelled to, res to respond to, uh, uh, to, to attacks that may not be, or to actions that may not be, uh, 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 that may not also have a, a physical component in them. And if that happens and other states accept that, there may be a development uh, of, the, of the legal rules. So that is to say that you know, the, the world of cyber operations is, is developing and, and we have still very limited state practice and very limited state practice in, in actual uh, real uh, life situations. And so we think that the prudent approach is to be to be cautious about the rules we identify and to have them grounded in a, uh, in the state practice as it exists, but to be also open to the possibility that in the future, as things evolve, there may be developments that will justify rethinking or reinterpreting some of these concepts. Thank you. And, and you know, we talk about the type of effects that, that cyber operations may have, and Professor Anna Petrick looks at a question with regard to the temporal aspects. And she says, the right to use force and self-defense is subject to a requirement of immediacy. However, in some cases, the fact that a cyber attack has occurred or is occurring may not be apparent for some time. What is your view on the immediacy criteria in such cases? Can it be interpreted more broadly or must the standard be the same for a kinetic or a physical attack? So I, I want to be cautious. I, I mean, I didn't uh, consider this specific scenario uh, be, before uh, this uh, presentation, and I don't want, you know, in, in that uh, uh, more formal and public context to make, uh, to take a definite view. I will say that imminence is a component, uh, of course, of, uh, of uh, or one of the requirements uh, for the use of self-defense. Uh, some view it as part of necessity, uh, and, and others see it as a, an independent uh, uh, prone. Provisionally, you know, without, uh, without uh, making any commitments on, on this, I think uh, that the, the, the imminence in, in such a scenario should relate to the point in time where, where one becomes aware of the, uh, of the attack and not, uh, and not the time that the attack was actually originated or uh, occurred. And obviously th these are, uh, you know, interesting questions and, and legal advice in this world can be interesting and certainly, I think, tricky. From your experience, what are the challenges in providing legal advice with, with respect to cyber operations? Well, uh, that's actually a, an, an excellent uh, question uh, to ask a deputy attorney general that uh, needs <laughs> to advise uh, on these issues. I, I will say some of the uh, Cyber operations and cyber in general is, is a field that requires a, requires a relatively high level of technical knowledge. And sometimes, not necessarily in Israel, uh, some of uh, our uh, political leaders uh, may have a uh, vast knowledge uh, of, uh, of uh, maybe cyber technology. But in some cases, uh, at senior levels, there may be gaps in the uh, understanding of, uh, of some of the technical issues. And I think that is a challenge when, you, when one needs to present uh, legal advice to, uh, to uh, uh, people that have less expertise, perhaps, on, uh, cyber, uh, on, on cyber technology. I think another aspect is sometimes the, the very fast 
pace that things happen. I mean, this is true also in other uh, uh, fields related to LOAC, to the laws of armed conflict, that the uh, and that the military operations need to uh, to take uh, to happen uh, relatively quickly, but uh, but in cyber it may be even a, a more uh, apparent. And maybe the last but not least is that the fact that the rules are still uh, very much uh, on many issues are very much in flux, and there is a, a large degree of uncertainty. It certainly puts the challenge to the legal advisor. Uh, how to describe or to provide the legal advice to the uh, uh, to the uh, uh, to those that uh, seek it, whether uh, you identify the scope of possible interpretations and let the uh, uh, the uh, military operators or the political uh, decision makers to decide the course of action, or whether you need to take a more uh, uh, to, to move or shift more of the decision making to the to the lawyers and take a more uh, uh, concrete uh, uh, and stronger views about what the uh, 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 appropriate legal interpretation uh, should uh, should be. I think that's a, a very important challenge given uh, where we are today uh, on the law of uh, cyber operation. Yeah, certainly and. And speaking of challenges, um, we're, we're running short of time here, but I do have one, one more question for you. You know, yesterday we talked a lot about um, you know, artificial intelligence and autonomy, how it is now and how we see it in the future. And so I'll ask you with regard to cyber operations, where do you see this cyber domain heading and what's Israel's role in the future? Well, I spent most of the time allocated to me here spe speaking about the uh, challenges that the uh, cyber operations uh, and cyber technology poses. But I think uh, the real story, of course, is, is the opportunities that cyber uh, uh, operations, uh, that cyber technology presents. And I think uh, cyber technology, of course, uh, creates huge opportunities for cooperation between states. I mentioned the, the uh, CERT as, a, as an example, but I think in many, uh, in many more uh, or in many additional fields. And certainly in the private sector, uh, cyber has a, a, a huge uh, promise of, uh, uh, of, of creating technologies that could make uh, and that do make life of uh, all of us uh, uh, much better, make uh, uh, production more efficient, make, may, make things cheaper. There are, there are many advantages, of course, to the cyber to to uh, in, in the cyber uh, in the cyber field, and I think Israel, uh, uh, with it with our technological uh, capabilities, is very much eager to participate uh, in in these uh, positive uh, processes. Really appreciate you participate today with us. I uh, really appreciate your, your comments and your frank answer to these questions. Um, and, and we hope you have a great evening and thank you for joining us toward the end of your day. Um, and we look forward to more engagement with you, you in the future. And, and of course, uh, Israel, thank you very much, doctor. Thank you very much. Uh, and uh, good luck with the rest of the conference. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, um, we will now uh, turn to our next panel, uh, which will be led by uh, Herbert Lin, and that will be the attribution of cyber operations. Uh, and if I ask Dr. Lin to join me here on screen, I will say that uh, this, this panel today um, is probably the most diverse with regard to time. Uh, I think that they're breaking the time-space continuum. We have Dr. Lin from the West Coast uh, and, and it is around uh, close to zero nine, his time. Um, and then we have um, Yuval Shaney who uh, is, is well into the evening um, where he is. And then uh, Tomohiro uh, is, uh, well, it's very, very early in the morning. And I think Tomohiro is going to win the award for the most painful time to be uh, a panelist here. So we thank him. But uh, so Dr. Herbert Lin is the Hank J. Holland Fellow in Cyber Policy and Security at the Hoover Institution. 
Uh, and now I uh, turn it over to Dr. Lin, please. Um, okay, uh, thank you for uh, having me. Um, uh, my role here is to present a short version of uh, the uh, some technical background uh, for, for, for attribution. Uh, and so that's my job uh, for the next 10 minutes. Um, so with that, um, next slide, please. Okay, so uh, the, our, our keynote speaker uh, made reference uh, to, to, to this about the conventional wisdom uh, being that you can't attribute uh, cyber operations uh, because the technical forensic information can be faked or, or, or false flag uh, with a variety of consequences if you can't, uh, uh, if you can't attribute. Um, but the convention, as he pointed out, uh, as a previous speaker pointed out, the conventional wisdom is wrong on this, or at least it's incomplete. Next slide, please. Okay, I wanna present a, uh, a scenario. It, 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 it's based on a, a US computer, but it, can, it, it doesn't matter that it's, that it, that it's US. Um, you can read it here. Uh, imagine a US computer is attacked in cyberspace. The attack comes from a computer based in Kansas owned by a, a grandmother. Um, the computer in Kansas was compromised using a computer in Greece. George was at the keyboard in Greece. George is a citizen, is a citizen of Germany, but also a member of Russian organized crime group. And the leader of the crime group was a close personal friend of the senior leader of the FSB. Who is responsible for the attack on the US computer? And I submit that whatever your answer is, uh, only the steps in red can be addressed technically. Everything else is a political or a policy decision. Next slide, please. So in, when you're talking about attribution, there are three meanings that you need to keep in mind. Are you trying to identify the machine or the machines that are responsible? That's a that's something for the uh, forensic people, the the uh, technical guys, the computer science guys. Okay. Is it the human operator who initiates the hostile action? That is the the, the guy sitting at the at, at at the keyboard. That is, you have to de you have to decide who is sitting at the, at at the keyboard. That's not a technical issue. Um, yes, I know you can activate the, the guy's computer or uh, the, the guy's um, camera on, on the computer, but he's wearing a mask. Uh, so uh, you, you don't really know uh, who's actually pressing the keys. Okay. Uh, and then the party who, who is ultimately responsible uh, for the actions of the human operator, that's a political determination. Who, who set this whole thing in, in, in motion? The most important point here is that the first uh, knowing any of those, the machine, the human, or the party, uh, does not necessarily give you any information about the others. Uh, and, and, and that's, you, you, you must keep that in mind. So when we talk about the, the party ultimately responsible, it can be determined by a variety of political decisions. Is it the geographical location of the machine that launched the attack? So therefore, Greece is responsible because that's where it was. Is it the, is it the, because George is a citizen of some country, then it's a German responsibility because its citizen did something bad. Um, and then it could be the entity under whose auspices the individual acted. Is, is George working for a, uh, for, for, for the organized crime cartel? Um, or is the crime cartel responsible? Again, all of these are political, uh, decisions. Now, what's the appropriate meaning for attribution? Um, it depends on what you're trying to do. If your goal is to try to mitigate the pain, to stop the pain of the attack as, as quickly as possible, you need to know the machine. You don't care who's operating the machine, you just want the machine to stop attacking you. Uh, if you want to take into a, if you want to prosecute the actor uh, or take him and take the person into custody, you need to actually know the human being who's at the keyboard. You have to know who that is. Um, are you trying to deter future acts? In that case, uh, you want to know the uh, the party who set the whole thing in motion. Next slide, please. Now, what does this attributing to a state mean? There's a whole range of this. This is stolen from a paper that Jason Healy at the Atlantic Council uh, wrote uh, about six or seven years ago. And it's still the best uh, uh, spectrum of, um, of meanings of what attribution 
to a state might mean. It goes all the way from, it might be state prohibited, but the state doesn't have any capability to enforce its prohibitions against it, against third party actions. Or the state tolerates it, or the state encourages it, or the state directs it, or the state actually conducts it. Okay, there are, uh, there's a range of meanings. Again, this is a political decision. You can decide what you want, uh, you know, which one of those uh, levels you want for and, and for what purpose. Next slide, please. Okay. The second, uh, the, 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 it, an important point about attribution is that it is not just about technical intelligence. It's not about forensics alone. Forensics are very important. They tell you, they give you the information about the one, about one attack. But there are many, many other sources of information. For example, you might have prepositioned sources. You might be monitoring uh, other people's networks, and then you see that they launched an attack. That's useful information. Okay? That's not forensic information from the attack uh, that happened on you, but that, that's from your other intelligence sources. Okay? The other guy may, may, may make some technical mistakes in his, in his tradecraft. Uh, so he might refer, he might use, there, there might be a, uh, a character string that turns out to be the name uh, that he used on his dating profile, uh, in which case you can go look up the, the dating profile and, and, and get some information uh, about him. And how do you know? Well, you pretend to be a person who's interested uh, in, in, in this person, and, and then you get them into a, a, a conversation and, and so on. You get, get information that way. There's a potential history. Uh, have they used this weapon or techniques before? It's, again, it's not definitive, but it's, it's suggestive. Uh, there are operational security failures. Uh, the other guy might dis discuss his plans on an open bulletin board or insecure media or brag about it on a cell phone. Um, and there's a, there's a geopolitical context. Who's making demands on, on you? Uh, what do they want? Um, and, and, and what else is going on in the world? All of these sources of information play into, in, 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 into this. What's really hard is prompt attribution. That is to know very quickly who's responsible. And that it takes time to analyze and, uh, and assemble uh, clues. Next slide, please. And for different levels of attribution of certainty, of certainty are needed for different goals. If you, in, in the United States, the standard is beyond a reasonable doubt for a criminal prosecution, okay? But there are lower levels, there are lower levels of, of certainty. There is the phrase clear and compelling. Uh, there is the phrase preponderance of the evidence. We know what that means. It's sort of more than 50%. Um, but the goal here is that you have to convince an, an impartial jury or judge. Uh, and and that, that, that's what you need. Um, in national security decision-making, the standards for taking action are much less formal. So due process, rights of the accused, they, they don't have any good analog. So you don't exclude evidence uh, from a, te for a technicality um, on, uh, in, in doing national security uh, decision-making. Um, there the audience is ourselves. We need to be convinced of who did it. Um, and it's a separate question of who, mu who else has to be convinced, for example, the public. Uh, so assigning responsibility, the bottom line here is assigning responsibility entails policy choices and not just technology. Next slide, please. Okay. Who are the parties that need to be convinced? So I, I mentioned one of them are the policymakers. Um, uh, a second possible audience is the... Uh, 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 is the, the, the national public uh, of, a, uh, of, of the attack nation. They have to be convinced that whatever the nation is going to do in response, uh, it's justified. Um, likely only partial information is gonna be available. For example, you might need to protect sources and methods of, of, of intelligence. This part is very, very complicated, uh, at least in the United States, because of huge arguments about uh, what a court of law is and the rights of the accused and really a confusion between criminal proceedings and uh, national security proceedings. Um, you may have to consider the leaders of other nations and that, that depends on reputation and trust to a large degree. I'll point out that in, in, uh, in the Cuban Missile Crisis, the Secretary, Secretary of State um, went over to uh, de Gaulle to ask for his support. Uh, and he offered to show uh, President de Gaulle the, uh, the pictures of the Russian, of the Soviet missiles in Cuba. 
And de Gaulle said, to, I'm sorry, I don't need to see them. If the president of the United States says it is true, I believe it, I believe you and France is with you, will stand with you. Can you imagine that happening now? Uh, that, that is just a, a, a mind boggling uh, image to, to consider now. It just wouldn't happen. So, you know, trust uh, makes a, a, a big difference here. And then, you know, the, the attacking government or the non-state actor, they'll never acknowledge it publicly. Um, they know its role. Uh, it, they know what they did. On the other hand, they, they might be unsure about what you know. Uh, and and uh, they can maintain plausible deniability unless extensive and undeniable evidence is, is, is available, which is highly un, un, unlikely. Some people say that naming and shaming helps. Um, hard to imagine uh, uh, certain countries being shamed uh, by their being pointed out. In fact, they may wanna be caught so that they, we understand what their powers are and, 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 and so on. So, uh, and I think that is the last slide. So uh, with that, I am pleased to uh, introduce um, my uh, two next uh, uh, speakers. Um, they have pre-recorded presentations and, and, and then they will um, uh, be live here to answer uh, and respond to, to questions. I'm supposed to moderate that. Uh, the first up is uh, Yuval Shani, who is the uh, uh, professor of public law at Hebrew University in, in Jerusalem, uh, and uh, Tomohiro uh, Mikanagi uh, is deputy legal advisor of the Japanese Foreign Ministry, uh, who oversees um, uh, international law uh, for for Japan, including cyberspace. So, with that, uh, Yuval, uh, please uh, let's have your presentation. Good morning, uh, and thank you for inviting me to this very interesting Disruptive Technologies and International uh, Law Conference. I'm very pleased to participate in this panel and to virtually meet a lot of uh, old friends and colleagues. Uh, my, my presentation will focus on the issue of uh, the possibilities for establishing an attribution mechanism uh, in international law. Uh, and it is uh, based on a, on a research project which uh, I have engaged uh, in in recent years together with a number of colleagues, including Mike Schmidt, who many of you uh, know, uh, Dan Efroni, who's been the Israeli MAG, Paul Duchesne, who's been with the, um, with the uh, Dutch military, and a number of additional researchers. Uh, and that research project was uh, trying to uh, look critically uh, at the question of why have uh, recent efforts to establish uh, an attribution mechanism have come to naught, and whether there is still a space to establish such a mechanism uh, for uh, certain purposes and for certain constituencies. Um, let, let me backtrack and, and, and try to situate the question of attribution within a broader framework, which is the, the framework of the rule of law in, in the field of cybersecurity. So um, we all know of these uh, allusions to cyberspace as Wild West or a lawless space, and we have all seen uh, uh, many efforts on the parts of lawyers and policymakers to try to uh, reduce that lawlessness by introducing uh, clearer standards, Tallinn Manual being uh, one of these efforts and recent uh, enunciations of states policies in the field of cyberspace um, but by a number of mostly European countries, uh, Australia as well, it is another effort to introduce uh, a greater role uh, or greater clarity about uh, what uh, international law actually governs cyberspace and and uh, hostilities and other forms of operations in cyberspace. Uh, but, but by and large, uh, a paper which uh, Dan Efroni and I uh, have written and published a couple of years ago in the American Journal of International Law uh, did, did suggest uh, quite strongly that although uh, some standards uh, clearly apply in, in cyberspace, there is a strong propensity um, by states, or at least there has been until recently, a strong propensity by states not to invoke international law when um, when encountering cyber attacks. And that implied that states that were uh, attacked uh, often didn't acknowledge that they were being attacked. Uh, 
uh, even when they acknowledged that they were being attacked, they often didn't point the finger uh, towards um, another state, and they often didn't uh, resort in any overt um, countermeasures uh, or retortions vis-a-vis -vis that, that, that other states. And even if they have done all, all these things, um, they have rarely, if ever, invoked international law uh, when doing so. And in that article, Efroni and myself have, 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 um, have presented a number of hypotheses as to why international law has been uh, so uh, marginalized uh, and over and beyond the question of whether the norms of international law are adequate to regulate uh, cyber operations and, and whether the kinetic international law uh, is fully applicable, is fully uh, amenable to adaptation to, to cyberspace. Um, it was also quite clear that states, some key states, are not interested in 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 invoking international law because they see international law as, in a way, limiting their options uh, in this field and serving as a constraint on their ability to operate below the radar screen and to generate deterrence uh, in that path. So there has been some preference for uh, non-legal, although we, we maintain still normative. Uh, response uh, in cyberspace. But perhaps, uh, and this is really what Schmidt and I have written on in, in this international uh, uh, law studies uh, piece um, on attribution, perhaps what one reason for this paucity of uh, utilization of international law in, in cyberspace um, has been the, um, the limited availability of attribution mechanisms in the following sense that if you are going to make um, an allegation against a state, if you want to name, blame, shame another state uh, that they have been involved in a violation of a legal norm uh, in cyberspace, then you should have some way to credibly make your case in the, in the court of, of public opinion, of world public opinion. And the non-availability of such a mechanism uh, could serve as one explanation for the limited uh, utilization of international law in cyberspace. Now, of course, this is not all. This is not. This does not mean that states cannot um, generate techni te technical attribution. Most states can do that, and that doesn't mean that states cannot convince their close allies to join themselves in making attribution. They often do. And we are seeing a rise in what is called collective attribution statements. Uh, but the fact that you do not have a credible international mechanism could serve as a, as a sort of constraint upon these efforts. Now, uh, what you could see, what you can see is that um, the, the, the fact that cyberspace in this regard um, is a sort of anomaly in the sense that in other branches of international law, the movement has been towards developing such attribution capacities. So one field where uh, there is uh, a very extensive use of fact-finding uh, as part of the uh, project of uh, improving compliance and strengthening implementation is human rights law, where you have a very broad host of um, fact-finders such as uh, reporters, fact-finding missions, uh, special treaty bodies, etc., that are, are raising, so to speak, the costs uh, of uh, violating uh, international uh, human rights law without paying a price. And, uh, and a similar logic could also um, apply in cyberspace. But perhaps even uh, more um, closely related are, are the developments that we have seen in, in the field of regulating weapons of mass destruction where we have seen uh, the major treaties that regulate chemical weapons or the use of uh, nuclear weapons or nuclear testing uh, to have introduced um, some technological capacity within their respective secretariats that would enable uh, those organizations to perform at the request of state parties uh, what are called challenges inspections or special inspections. And in fact, when one is looking at the recent experience of the United Kingdom uh, following the Salisbury attack in 2018, uh, this uh, the use of chemical uh, agents vis-a-vis uh, -vis two uh, Russian citizens, it is, quite, um, uh, it, it is quite interesting to see how, although the United Kingdom clearly had the capacity to uh, conduct its own investigation uh, and to identify the chemical agent in question, the UK went out of its way to invite uh, OPCW assistance um, in Salisbury so as to generate greater credibility to, to its finding and to point the, the finger more poignantly 
um, vis-a-vis Russia. And, 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 and I believe, and, Sch- and Schmidt and, and I in the article claim, that the same logic could also apply in certain circumstances, also uh, with regard to uh, attribution of responsibility in cyberspace. And indeed, we think that if one looks at what, uh, what recent developments in the last two, three years um, show, is that actually we are moving in a direction where the, the lack of an attribution mechanism is going to prove more and more problematic. And that direction comprises of first, an increased propensity by states to engage in collective attribution. And we have seen a move by states post WannaCry and not Petya to engage in broader and broader collective attribution statements. And, and, and we believe that without having a credible uh, attribution mechanism, uh, there would be limits on the degree to which, to which states would be uh, willing to take um, victim states at their word in terms of, uh, of, uh, of joining an attribution statement without actually having some independent, uh, independent guarantee, independent safeguard as to the credibility of the attribution statements and an international mechanism could help in this regard. And secondly, we have seen a, a movement uh, toward a more institutionalized sanction regime, especially within the context of the uh, EU. And here the interplay between generating blacklists, uh, which uh, impose compulsory sanctions on uh, individuals and groups that are involved in cyber operations, and the need for, um, for meeting certain due process requirements in domestic courts, this is going to generate a considerable push on European countries to, to generate a, a, a credible mechanism that would vet these, um, these attribution uh, allegations. Now, add to that a more multilateral um, uh, outlook by NATO and also by the US in its, in its, uh, in its cyber uh, policy, uh, in its cyber deterrence initiative, uh, this all points to um, an increased uh, attempt to go uh, multilaterally against states and groups within states that engage in um, in hostile uh, and harmful uh, cyber operation or malicious uh, cyber activity. And the argument is that the uh, increased density of uh, multilateralism in, in this field of cybersecurity does, um, uh, does assume or does require a, a legal infrastructure, but also an institutional infrastructure to support this and that an international mechanism that will be optional, that would be state-centered, and uh, that would be um, that would uh, generate uh, credible uh, attribution findings, both for states with limited um, technological capacity, and, but also more importantly, states that need to enhance their diplomatic uh, push capacity. Uh, and also uh, with uh, as to accompany uh, institutions and multilateral initiatives in this field, this could be a very uh, important uh, step forward. And that past initiatives in this field, uh, a principal reason why they have not succeeded has been that they have not uh, uh, closely identified and uh, and honed their uh, scope of uh, power, structures, uh, ambitions, so to speak. Uh, vis-a-vis that specific constituency and those specific aims. So uh, this has been a very brief uh, introduction of uh, the raison d'etre for uh, continuing to pursue the project of developing an international attribution mechanism. And I'll be very happy uh, during further um, discussions in this conference and, and in other venues to continue to think about how uh, we can go forward, at, both with regard to the specifics of what such a mechanism should look like, but also with regard to how are we going to get from point A to point B and, and basically identify those states and structures that could advance uh, this idea uh, in practical terms. Thank you very much for your time and attention. And uh, next up is the pre-recorded presentation of, of Tom Harrell. Hello, I am Tomohiro Mikanagi, uh, Deputy Legal Advisor of Japanese Ministry of Foreign Affairs. It's my great pleasure to participate in this conference. 
I'm working for the government, but the following presentation will be made in my uh, personal capacity. Uh, the following presentation, uh, first, uh, before addressing the main issue of attribution, I will touch upon the ongoing debate concerning violation of sovereignty. Then I will address the issue of attribution to states under international law. And lastly, uh, considering the uncertainty about the feasibility of attribution, I will briefly talk about uh, due diligence obligation. This uh, spring, uh, responding to the cyber incidents targeting medical facilities amid the uh, pandemic, more than 100 public international lawyers uh, coordinated by Oxford scholars jointly issued this statement here. Later in August, uh, they issued another statement focusing on the cyber operations targeting vaccine research. They strongly endorsed the existence of uh, primary rules prohibiting cyber operations that have serious adverse consequences for essential medical services in the other states. The legal basis for this prohibition seems to be uh, the violation of sovereignty. The violation of sovereignty is probably the most uh, likely uh, legal basis to be used against actual uh, cross-border uh, cyber operations. But there's ongoing debate over the relationship between the violation of sovereignty and no intervention. I understand uh, many states, including Japan, have been recognizing the existence of rules uh, prohibiting violation of sovereignty beyond uh, rules of uh, non-intervention. But there are also uh, different views. In this uh, context, I'd like to draw your attention to Article 32B of the Budapest Convention, uh, quoted here. Uh, this provision seems to indicate a uh, participating state's view that access by a state to uh, data in another state without lawful and voluntary consent is not allowed. If so, the legal basis for such a uh, restriction seems to be the respect for sovereignty. Uh, this issue requires further discussion, but state practice, including those relating to the uh, relevant international agreements uh, should be taken into account. With that, um, now I'll move to the main issue of attribution. There has been no case before ICJ uh, directly dealing with the issue of attribution of cyber operations to states. And most of the so-called attribution statements are ambiguous about their evidence. But uh, affidavit on the Park Jin Hyuk case uh, published in 2018 was relatively detailed. Um, this affidavit argued that Mr. Park was a member of the conspiracy behind uh, many cyber incidents. And he was working on behalf of the North Korean government. This is a, a figure uh, showing the image of the evidence in the affidavit. DPRK is shown uh, in the top right. Uh, Mr. Park is shown with a photo in the left. Uh, small red boxes uh, connected by arrows constitute the IT infrastructure uh, used in cyber operations. And blue boxes in the bottom are actual cyber operations. Affidavit explains that programs used in various operations had strong similarities, uh, therefore indicating the same author. Uh, it also explains connections between address and accounts used in these operations and those used by Mr. Park. In addition, it explains a connection to DPRK, including access to these email accounts from IP addresses in DPRK and use of uh, email accounts using these operations by DPRK officials. This affidavit gives an impression that it is not impossible to prove the perpetrator 
implementing cyber operations through uh, these evidence. On the other hand, uh, due to the uh, multiple layers of aliases and proxies, it seems more uh, difficult to obtain evidence proving control by a state over cyber operations. Regarding the attribution under international law, ILC articles on state responsibility clarify the substantive rules of attribution. The most relevant article applicable to uh, cyber operations, which are likely to be conducted through proxies, seems to be Article 8 uh, here. This article refers to uh, instruction, direction, or control, which requires certain specificity and uh, strength of the influence of the state over the conduct in question. Evidence relating to the use of uh, various uh, components of IT infrastructure and relating to similarities among programs may be able to prove IT infrastructure used in cyber operations and possibly the perpetrator who implemented the operation. But due to the aliases and proxies, it seems difficult to collect direct evidence proving instruction, direction, or control by state. With regard to the issue of evidence, the Coke Channel judgment said, uh, when victim state is unable to present direct proof due to the exclusive territorial control by the respondent, such a state should be allowed uh, more liberal recourse to inferences of fact and circumstantial evidence. In addition, indirect and uh, circumstantial evidence is to be accorded special weight when it is based on a series of facts which are linked together and lead logically to a single conclusion. The judgment also indicated the relationship between gravity and standard of proof. And Judge Higgins, in her separate opinion on the oil platform uh, judgment, referred to the general agreement that graver charges require higher standard of proof. So uh, this should also mean that uh, less serious charges would require uh, lower standard of proof. So uh, violation of sovereignty is not so serious as the use of force or genocide. And evidence on attribution of cyber operations emanating from other states is difficult to obtain. So recourse to indirect and circumstantial evidence should be allowed. And the standard of proof for violation of sovereignty should not be as high as in cases concerning use of force or genocide. However, uh, in order to lead logically to a single conclusion of the existence of instruction, direction, or control by a state, facts uh, showing a strong influence of a state over the IT infrastructure used in cyber operations or over the perpetrator must be collected and linked together. Here are some cases indicating the uh, existence of such evidence, but unfortunately their details are not published. So at the moment it is difficult to say whether it is possible to obtain sufficient evidence for proving attribution to states. Considering this uncertainty as an alternative path to uh, state responsibility, applicability of due diligence obligation should also be uh, considered. ICJ confirmed in the Coruff Channel judgment, every state's obligation not to allow knowingly its territory to be used for acts contrary to the rights of other states. This obligation exists as a general obligation under international law, and there is a consensus that existing international law applies to cyberspace. So there are states, including Japan, who think this obligation applies to cyber operation. However, UN members have not yet agreed on whether it applies to cyber operations. Um, in order to address the concerns of some states, about its extensive application, I think it is uh, important to uh, clarify and discuss its core content. In this regard, uh, jurisprudence relating to the concept of due diligence should be referred to. 
Among such、uh, jurisprudence, the Alabama Arbitral Award pointed out that due diligence obligation ought to be exercised in proportion to the risk, and Bosnian genocide judgment characterized the obligation to prevent genocide as due diligence and found its violation by FRY's failure to use its capacity to influence Bosnian Serb army. In my view,、uh, the proportionality to the seriousness and obligation to use The capacity to influence are inherent in the nature of the due diligence. So,、uh, this should be、uh, agreed as core content of the due diligence obligation applied to cyber operations.、Uh, this core content would mean if a state is financially or otherwise supporting a non state actor and becomes aware of a risk of the actor to engage in serious cyber operations. Damaging critical infrastructure of other states, the state must stop its support. Here is the summary of my presentation. Violation of sovereignty should not be excluded from primary rules of international law applicable to cyber operations, and due to the layers of aliases and proxies, it seems difficult to obtain direct evidence showing states' control over actual operations. So, recourse to indirect and circumstantial evidence、uh, should be allowed, and standard of proof should be lowered for less、uh, serious charges. Evidence showing、uh, state's influence over IT infrastructure、uh, used for cyber operations and perpetrators should contribute to the proof of attribution, but it is difficult to say whether it is possible to obtain sufficient evidence for proving attribution to state. Therefore, the application of due diligence obligation should not be denied, and discussion on its core content should commence. Thank you very much for listening. Okay, thank you for both of those、uh, presentations. And I think now, with the scheduled calls for、uh, the three of us,、uh, Yuval Tomihiro、uh, and, and me, to、uh, get together online live. Uh, so, if our tech people could arrange that, that would be great, and we can start the, 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 the discussion. Uh, Tomohiro and uh, uh, Yuval, uh, are you, Yuval, are you here? Ah, excellent. Thank you. Uh, so, uh, the first uh, question here uh, comes uh, uh, from、uh, Laura Dickinson,、uh, and, and, and the question raises a, a question which I, I had too. She asks uh, uh, whether the,、uh, you, you, well, you propose to use human rights mechanisms、uh, as a model for de developing an attribution mechanism. Uh, and she asked, How do you propose to address the, the weakness, namely that、uh, states often stonewall special rapporteurs because state consent is required for access、uh, and, and so on, and therefore you don't get the,、uh, the information that you need? I had a similar question in, in that,、uh, which is, is that many states will just not be willing to give up the information that they have、um, because、uh, about. Uh, attribution. I know the United States certainly wouldn't be willing to give up inform much information about attribution because it comes from sensitive sources and methods. I was wondering how you would address that question. Right.、Uh, hi there. And I was also asked by Doki Lovati, and I, I've raised this, this、uh, question by mistake about the Cyber Peace Institute. So maybe if there is time, I can also、okay, uh, take this、fine. issue as well. We will.、Uh, so, 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 Laura's question、uh, well, it's a great question. And, and of course,、uh, I mean, the human rights、uh, model has,、uh, has many、um, interesting dimensions, but also many disadvantages, which、uh, have been served eight years. And one of these bodies I'm painfully aware of. Uh, but uh, I think what, two major、uh, differences、uh, are one, I mean, when talking about human rights fact finding, normally one is talking about entering into one country in order to ascertain violations committed by that country vis a vis its own population. Here, I think that the, the problem pattern that we are thinking about is, is, somewhat, is somewhat different. Here, we're talking about a state that has been the victim. Of a cyber attack that originated from another state. So, this is a little bit more like the UK Salisbury attack, 
when you have uh, state A committing an attack against state B and state B actually interested to go out of its way to cooperate with the investigation in order to generate an international finding that would help it diplomatically to turn the table vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the attacking state. And this also uh, goes to your point, Herb, about the issue of uh, cooperation. Of course, a state that has uh, its own capacity and its own diplomatic uh, uh, um, uh, possibilities, opportunities, they, they may not need such a mechanism. But if you take a, a, a mid-sized state, which may have uh, limited technological capacity and also very limited diplomatic uh, uh, weight, so to speak, F for such a state, I mean, uh, uh, being transparent vis-a-vis -vis the mechanism, of course, everything could be still protected by all, all sorts of confidentiality safeguards. F for this state, this is not a bad, this is not a bad deal to get a, an official finding by an international body that it was the target of an attack. So if Ukraine, for instance, wants to uh, leverage, uh, to, to, to basically assemble public opinion vis-a-vis uh, -vis Russia in a, in a, in a, in a cyber conflict, uh, I think it is, it is more likely than not that they will be uh, quite cooperative with an international technical body that would actually look at the evidence, look at the computers and, and, and assess the data. Uh, that uh, that is available there, and, and just on the side. Sorry, no, please continue. I, no, I was going to say on the cyber on the Cyber Peace Institute, uh, the question by uh, Ido. I, I think that's a great uh, step forward, but of course, uh, the Cyber Peace Institute is not a is not an international uh, mechanism for fi fact finding. It, it's a mechanism that collects a lot of information about cyber attacks. It includes it includes transparency. It uh, provides it develops tools. It would also develop norms, but it does not engage in specific investigations uh, as to who. Who did it? I mean, who was behind specific attacks? And this is the gap that we're working on. So, Yuval, I, I think that your uh, proposal, uh, I mean, you made a very clear and compelling case, I think, for the idea that a mechanism is necessary and would be helpful. Um, and I think you have said just now, and tell me if I'm wrong, is that if this is going to work, it's going to require full access to uh, at, le at the very least the targeted nations, uh, computers and, and so on to, to gather forensics and, 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 and the like, uh, and may in fact require a range of other information perhaps available from other sources uh, to contribute to the judgment. Is, is, and then if it doesn't have that, uh, it's to the extent it doesn't have that, it's likely to not succeed. Yeah, I, I think you would need to have uh, you you need to have a high degree of access to the so so to speak uh, crime scene uh, to the in order to get the forensic rights uh, forensics right. Otherwise, I don't think it's going to be very useful, and it's not going to have credibility. Uh, I mean, we I mean, states already do that with private companies. It's not so exceptional. I mean, states do bring in private uh, cybersecurity companies to conduct these sort of investigations and they sign them on to confidentiality agreements. And I think you can envision that a similar, a similar arrangement would be undertaken with, a, with an international attribu interstate inter attribution mechanism that would be bound to the same confidentiality requirements. Okay. Um, so, uh, Michael uh, Pazansky, uh Anyway, my, my, Michael uh, asks, uh, also asks you, can you speak to the barriers uh, of uh, associated with collection attribution, uh, given the issues of sources and methods? Yeah, I mean, exactly. This is how, currently how it, uh, this is really the, uh, the, the, the current impediment that we have, because we do have collective attributions at this point in time. But uh, the, it's basically uh, based on some leap of faith. I mean, states are willing. To, so, so, so some very close allies, I mean, the Five Eyes, what have you, they share intelligence, okay? So, so there are some countries that share uh, with each other intelligence and within this small cluster of countries, there isn't really a problem. But once you start widening the scope and if you really wanna get dozens of states on board, it, this, this may not work unless you find ways to generate trust. So, so basically just taking a state on its, uh, on, 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 on its word, I mean, this is, this is not likely to fly very high and it's going to look as if the states that have, uh, you know, uh, joined ranks with the state that have been attacked have done this out of political reasons 
and not because they are trying you know, to uphold a legal principle. And that would make also the collective attribution considerably uh, less persuasive in the court of world opinion and, and would also uh, raise question marks, especially if some legal measures are attached to that, such as you know, freezing, uh, freezing bank accounts, issuing personal sanctions, uh, or taking even uh, uh, hackbacks or what have you. So, so, uh, so this is really what's the impediment that we are seeing now. And the proposal here is really to fix this by creating, you know, introducing an option and a mechanism option okay. for states who are willing to share. Of course, states who are not willing to share information would, would still have to go it alone and, and, you know, rely on trust that they are able to generate. But, but for some states, this could be an, an opening. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, the question for Tomohiro from, from uh, Professor Kanahara, uh, who asks whether it is possible to apply um, uh, the uh, uh, Article 8 from the Articles of State Responsibility because uh, of the unclear definition in, uh, of instruction, direction, and, 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 and control. Uh, so I was wondering if you could uh, respond to, to that question. Yes, uh, thank you for the uh, question, uh, Professor Kanehara. Um, I agree, these uh, uh, terminologies are not clearly defined. So it is uh, not appropriate to rely on each a term in detail. But I think that the general thrust of this Article 8 is you need to uh, explain certain specific specificity about uh, you know, attribution. Uh, some influence by the state over the perpetrator. If you are arguing for uh, the attribution uh, to the state, and uh, generally speaking, it is difficult to get uh, obtain uh, information evidence uh, directly uh, showing the uh, you know uh, strong influence of a state over the perpetrator. So I don't. I agree that this uh, article itself is not uh, clearly defined, and but still it has a kind of a, uh, indication that uh, you need to be careful when you are uh, attributing to a state, and uh, you need to show some evidence uh, showing a strong uh, connection to state. Uh, okay, and I'm going to take one one more from uh, uh, Eric Jensen. Hi, Eric. Um, uh, that uh, our, our keynote speaker stated uh, with, that with respect to that, that sovereignty uh, can't be assumed. Uh, the customary rule in other domains automatically uh, applies into the cyber domain. That is, you can't assume the sovereignty is there. Do you agree with that uh, statement with respect to sovereignty? Tom Hero. Oh, sorry, I couldn't hear your question. Um, could you repeat? Sorry, right. it's in it, it's it's in the uh, chat. If you want to take a look, um, mm -hmm. our keynote speaker said that uh, uh, with respect to sovereignty, uh, that it can't be assumed that the customary rule on other domains automatically applies to sovereignty. Do you agree with that? And does it strengthen your argument uh, here uh, that we should look at and do 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 due diligence? Yeah. Um, that is a very good question. I think, uh, generally speaking, uh, existing international law should apply. And uh, uh, in my view, you know, uh, violation of sovereignty and due diligence are general principles and general obligation of states, uh, which should apply to any areas of international law. But on the other hand, cyber uh, space have its uh, uh, kind of a uh, uh, unique character, and it is uh, you need to be very cautious in applying these general, uh, little bit ambiguous concepts to this particular unique uh, space. So I, uh, my approach is probably different from the keynote speaker. I'm starting from the uh, applicability of these general obligation uh, to cyberspace, but. I also agree that approach uh, must be very careful and cautious. So uh, special uh, character of cyberspace should be taken into account when applying this uh, general obligation. <laughs> thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, I think that's uh, it for our time uh, here. Thank you very much uh, for all of uh, the, the questions. Again, the apologies to people who have not been able to get into queue. Thank you.
Uh, gentlemen, thank you very much. And Dr. Lynn, thank you for moderating it. And, and again, I thank each of you for joining us at what is most notably inconvenient times for all three of you. Uh, we appreciate that. Um, and at that, we will turn to our lunch break. Uh, we will come back on at 3.30 for a panel that is co-sponsored by the Royal Air Force. And that panel will address perfidy, ruses, and blockades in cyberspace. Interesting to be sure. Thank you again very much and have a wonderful lunch. Welcome back from the break, everyone. Uh, it's now my great pleasure to introduce the moderators, plural, for uh, our next panel. Um, Air Vice Marshal Tam Jennings OBE is the Director of Legal Services for the Royal Air Force. Uh, and during her distinguished career in the RR, she served in myriad roles, including deployments to Kosovo, Oman, Bahrain, and Canada alongside Headquarters 1 UK Armoured Division. Her operational tour advising the UK Red Hot card holder, sorry, in the Chaos and LED saw her awarded an AOC's commendation. Air Colonel Mark Phelps, OBE, is the Deputy Director uh, of Legal Services for the Royal Air Force. He served as legal advisor to Special Operations Command Elements in Afghanistan and acted as the Chief Advisor to the Protect, which is the 2011 campaign in Libya. He's also currently undertaking research for a PhD focused on the legal, ethical, and moral implications of autonomous warfare. So, Mom, over to you, and thank you. Kieran, thank you very much. Um, firstly, I must thank uh, Rear Admiral Chatfield um, for her kind words yesterday, and also Professor James Krasker for uh, the invitation today, and also for allowing Kieran the opportunity to organise this conference. It's no surprise to me that what I've seen so far has been first class. It is my great pleasure alongside my colleague, Air Commodore Mark Phelps, to act as a moderator for this panel. He'll ask the questions to avoid confusion uh, in typical officer, senior officer fashion. Um, I delegated that part of the moderation to him. Um, the use of ruses and blockades have a long history in the art of war, as has the condemnation of killing by treachery. So this panel will look to clarify how, if at all, such long-standing methods of warfare apply in an era of cyber operations. So without further ado, let me introduce our first panelist. Kubo Machak is a legal advisor in the ICRC's legal division. And he's also the general editor of the Cyber Law Toolkit, which is an, inline, uh, an online interactive resource on the international law of cyber operations. Kubo, over to you. Good afternoon from Geneva. Uh, it is a pleasure to be here and to speak today about cyber deception during armed conflict on behalf of the International Committee of the Red Cross. And so during today's uh, brief talk, I'm going to focus on specifically rules on perfidy and ruses of war as they apply in the cyber context. And I'll try to illustrate it on a few practical examples. So before we begin, we have to ask ourselves what we actually understand under deception. And, you know, weaving together approaches from military doctrine and psychology and general dictionary definitions, let me propose the following working definition, that under uh, the deception, we're going to understand the use of measures that are designed to mislead another by either manipulation, distortion, fabrication, or falsification of information in order to induce the misled party to act or to fail to act, as the case may be, in a way that's prejudicial to their interests. Now, in the cyber context, when we talk about deception, this may relate to a number of things. It may relate to the origin of the cyber operation, so meaning where it is actually launched from. So we can think of you know, false flag operations as those that deceive us to the origin of the operation. It can deceive us to the nature of the cyber operation. You know, uh, it can uh, masquerade in placement of malware as legitimate communication or the effects of the cyber operation. So it might appear to freeze computers, but in fact, what it does is it wipes the data off those computers. And it can also relate to information that concerns persons, objects, or events in the physical world. And we will see that uh, how that can happen on some of our examples. So when we talk about deception in the context of IHL, of course, for the ICRC, the start is that IHL as a body of law applies to cyber operations during armed conflicts. Now, this is still an issue that is being debated by states, but I think it's fair to say that a growing number of states uh, accept and affirm the applicability of IHL to cyber operations during armed conflicts. And so this is going to be the, the premise on which the rest of the talk is made or is based. But uh, 
That being said, we have to acknowledge that IHL is not the only legal framework or not even often the most appropriate legal framework for all conduct, even during an armed conflict. And so what is relevant here is that the act in question or the conduct in question must have a sufficient link to an ongoing armed conflict. And so, you know, what we refer to this to this test is the nexus requirement. And it's maybe better illustrated on a specific example. So in the cyber context, if we have a non-combatant who uses deception to infect some computer systems with malware, and then this person, this non-combatant, attempts to extract ransom from the users of those computers. Now, this is clearly a cyber operation involving deception. It might even take place during an ongoing armed conflict, and it might even mm, take advantage of, for example, the lessened effectiveness of the police during the armed conflict. But it would still not be governed by IHL because of its lack of nexus to the conflict. And so, you know, the applicable legal framework to assess such a cyber operation would be the domestic criminal law in the territory in question. But now there are, of course, many operations that will have this nexus. So let's have a look at how IHL uh, will apply to them. Now, I would propose that we put these types of operations on a so-called deception spectrum. So let's start with examples that are clearly prohibited. And so this is the notion of prohibited perfidy. And in identifying the elements of prohibited perfidy, uh, we are basing ourselves on Article 37, Paragraph 1 of the Additional Protocol 1, and also Rule 65 of the ICRC Customary International Humanitarian Law Study. And so on that basis, we see that the key elements are that the cyber operation needs to relate to a protection that's provided for in IHL, for example, the protection of civilians or protection of civilian objects against attacks. Then this cyber operation must invite the confidence of the adversary that they are either entitled to receive this protection or that they must accord this protection uh, to uh, someone else. Then thirdly, the there is a condition that the perpetrator must intentionally betray the adversary's confidence. So it invites and then betrays that confidence. And then finally, the cyber operation in question must result in the adversary's death or injure, and in the ICRC's view, also capture. And I would say that perhaps with the exception of that last word, the rest of the definition is not so controversial even under customary international law, although I'm very happy to discuss it in the Q&A afterwards. Now, moving on with our spectrum, on the other side of the spectrum, we have permitted ruses. Now, permitted ruses are cyber in the cyber context are cyber operations that do rely on deception to mislead the adversary, because if it didn't rely on deception, we would be outside of the scope of today's panel, Days, uh, of, of my talk and of what we are doing. But there are two additional conditions. The second condition is that the cyber operation itself must not infringe any rule of IHL. And then the third condition is that the cyber operation does not invite the confidence of the adversary with regard to the protection under IHL. And so together, these three conditions can be identified on the basis, again, of Article 37, but now it's second paragraph in Additional Protocol 1, and it also reflects the rule as it was identified in the ICRC's Customary International Humanitarian Law Study in Rule 57. Now, often when perfidy and ruses are discussed, this is where the investigation ends, but I would put it to you that the spectrum actually consists of quite an important part of types of conduct that fall between perfidy and ruses. And so this is the area or the idea of non-prohibited perfidy. Now, in the words of the ICRC's uh, commentary on additional protocols, between prohibited perfidy and permitted ruses of war, there is, quote unquote, a sort of a gray area of perfidy which is not explicitly sanctioned as such. But what we must keep in mind is that even though these types of conduct that we might describe as perfidious, but because they will fail to meet all four conditions of perfidy, they will not amount to prohibited perfidy, they may still fall foul of other rules of IHL. And so maybe the best way how to do that is to look at specific examples. So let me move on to three such examples. And for their discussion, let's, let us assume that we are in an international armed conflict for, for the sake of simplicity. So IHL clearly applies. And let me give you three examples that you can think about and see where you would place them on the spectrum that we have just discussed. So first of all, 
let's have a, a situation in which there is a humanitarian organization, we will not give it a name, which designs a phone application that's used by the beneficiaries. Now, unfortunately, one of the belligerents hacks into that phone application and then using the platform, using the phone app that, that was designed by the humanitarian organization, this belligerent starts sharing fake messages with the beneficiaries. And so what it does is, for example, it tells them to arrive at a certain destination where aid will be dispersed. And so the civilian population does that. And in doing so, they block a bridge. And as a result, the enemy cannot send reinforcements, which leads to a big military advantage for the belligerent that was acting. So you see the, the element of deception. I'm going to leave the legal analysis on the side for the time being. Let's now have a look at the second example. So the second example here, we have fake military networks. So what's this, what does this represent? What's the, what is this idea? So this idea is that uh, one of the belligerents sets up fake digital platforms, and it does that in order to dissimulate its own real military networks. And so the effect is that the enemy who, is, who wants to penetrate the military networks of the first belligerent is spending a lot of time and a lot of resources trying to compromise the fake systems. And again, this results in a military advantage to the first belligerent. And then thirdly, uh, let's uh, uh, consider an example of a fake civilian airliner. So in this uh, example, one belligerent gains unauthorized access to the enemy's air traffic systems. And so as it does that, it manipulates the system of the enemy to misidentify an incoming attack aircraft as a civilian airliner. So there is an incoming attack aircraft but because of the unauthorized access to the enemy system, it gets mischaracterized, misidentified as a civilian airliner. But then the military aircraft conducts a successful attack against the enemy, which results in the deaths of combatants uh, belonging to that side of the conflict. So again, military advantage in the, uh, through the means of deception. Now, let's move back to our spectrum that I described earlier on. So how would we analyze these uh, cases? So let's start firstly with the military networks. Now, clearly, this cyber operation relies on deception to mislead the adversary, right? Because it leads them to believe that these networks have a military value. But it does not infringe any rule of IHL. There is no rule of IHL against creating false networks. And in fact, decoys are expressly mentioned in Article 37, Paragraph 2 as a permissible rules of war. And then finally, the cyber operation does not invite the confidence of the adversary with respect to protection under IHL, because the networks, even if they were real, they would constitute a military objective, so they would not be protected under IHL. So we can place uh, this example under permitted ruses. Now, secondly, let's take the civilian airliner. Now, this, uh, I would put it to you, much clearly falls under prohibited perfidy. Why? Well, we mentioned four conditions. So first of all, there must be a protection provided by IHL. Yes, here we have the protection of civilian objects, like, an, like a civilian airliner, against attack. The operation must invite the confidence of the adversary that they must accord that protection. Yes, they believe that they cannot attack this, uh, that, uh, this supposed airliner. And thirdly, the per perpetrator must intentionally betray the adversaries. And so again, yes, this condition is met because it betrays the confidence by using that confidence to launch an attack through the actual military aircraft. And then finally, the cyber operation must result in the adversary's death, injury, or capture, and we have said that the attack was lethal. So this uh, operation would qualify as prohibited perfidy. And then finally, we have the uh, fake aid application, the fake aid uh, or the, the abuse of the humanitarian app or on so I would put it to you that this falls somewhere in the middle because the operation does not meet all of the four conditions of perfidy. And specifically, it does mislead someone, but it does not mislead the adversary, right? So it doesn't meet the second and the third condition because it does not invite or betray the confidence of an adversary, but it invites and, and perhaps betrays the confidence of the civilian population of the beneficiaries of this app. So as regards, as far as the spectrum of from perfidy to ruses is concerned, such an operation does not violate the prohibition of perfidy, but that does not mean that the operation is permitted by IHL. It could amount to a violation of a number of different rules of IHL, which we don't have enough time for today, but it could be the misuse of established indicators, right? If this is a, an app that uses, for example, the Red Cross as its emblem, 
it uh, might uh, amount to a violation of the obligation to respect and protect humanitarian relief personnel, and it might also amount to a violation of the prohibition on the use of human shields. So there might be other rules of IHL that would be implicated by this particular operation. Now, if you would like to explore these issues further, uh, as you might know, the ICRC is involved in the Cyber Law Toolkit project along with several partners. And so just a, a few weeks ago, we actually issued a big update of the project. And one of the new scenarios focuses specifically on cyber deception during armed conflicts. So if you look at that uh, particular scenario, which is scenario 15, you will find some of the case studies I mentioned today and much more. And uh, I hope you will find it useful. And I hope that you found this presentation interesting and I look forward to continuing it in the Q&A afterwards. Thank you. Great, thank you. Our second speaker is Jeff Biller, who is an assistant professor of cyber, work, of cyber law and policy with Cyberworks, which is a department of the United States Air Force Academy. He's also the co-director of the Air Force Academy's Law, Technology and Welfare Research Cell. Over to you, Jeff. Hello, my name is Jeff Biller. I'm an assistant professor of cyber law and policy and the co-director of the Law, Technology and Warfare Research Cell at the United States Air Force Academy. I'd like to issue a very special thank you to the Stockton Center for inviting me to participate in this conference. Uh, the Stockton Center is a place that has a very uh, special place in my heart, having spent three wonderful years there. Um, as indicated on the screen, today's uh, discussion is on uh, protected indicators in cyberspace. A long-held protection under IHL exists for aid organizations such as the ICRC and observer organizations such as the UN. These groups are distinguished through the use of various indicators governed by an extensive body of law, international humanitarian law. The basic notion of extending the body of IHL regarding these indicators into cyberspace is uncontroversial. However, a full agreement does not yet exist as to what constitutes recognized indicators in the cyber domain. The IHL rules against the improper use of protected and recognized indicators developed as a recognition uh, to the need to protect certain classes of individuals, organizations, and locations on the battlefield from targeting by combatants. As such, the law focuses primarily on these emblems use as concrete visible representations. Although it is unlikely that the use of protected indicators in a purely electronic environment was initially envisaged, I believe the language within the relevant articles is broad enough to encompass its extension into the cyber domain. The first Geneva Convention defines the emblem of the Red Cross and delineates its permissible use. Specifically, GC1 states that the emblem and the words Red Cross may not be employed either in time of peace or in time of war, except to indicate or to protect the medical units and establishments, the personnel and material protected by the present convention and other conventions dealing with similar matters. Similarly, Article 38 of AP1 prohibits the improper use of the distinctive emblem of the Red Cross, Red Crescent or Red Lion and Sun, and also to make use of the distinctive emblem of the United Nations, except as authorized by that organization. The 2016 commentary to GC1 notes that the GC emblems may serve both as a protective device indicating protection under the convention and as an indicative sign demonstrating its a connection to the organization of the International Red Cross and Red Crescent. Although the indicative uses, use does not imply that the bearer holds protections under the convention, its improper use is still prohibited. AP1 does not address the indicative use focusing on the protective use, which provides a visible sign of the protection conferred by international law on certain persons and objects. Unlike misuse of the emblem as an indicative sign, the ICRC customary international law study found that a misuse of the protective function could implicate the prohibition on perfidy. GC1 Article 53 further expands the law relating to the GC emblems including any sign or designation constituting an imitation thereof, whatever the object of such use. By including imitations thereof, such as the abbreviation ICRC, Article 53 broadens the prohibition and suggests that abbreviations or approximations of the words Red Cross that are meant to imitate an official representation would violate this prohibition. AP1 also prohibits the unauthorized use of the distinctive emblem of the UN, 
However, the treaty law governing the UN emblem is less expansive than that of the Red Cross emblems and protects neither the words United Nations nor approximations thereof. Additional categories of protected emblem signs and signals established under international law include the Hague 4 and AP1 prohibition against uh, the improper use of a flag of truce and the AP1 prohibition against deliberate misuse in an armed conflict of other internationally recognized protective symbols, uh, signs, or signals. Recognized protected indicators include those markings that indicate objects or locations, such as installations containing dangerous forces, uh, cultural property, among others. Unlike the prohibition on perfidy, there is an absolute character to those prohibitions, meaning that there is no requirement for a particular result following the prohibited misuse. Extension of the basic rule prohibiting making improper use of the protective emblem signs or signals that are set forth in the law of armed conflict into the cyber domain is relatively uncontroversial. However, protected indicators signal the ability to trust, and trust plays a prominent role in network security systems which depend on forming trust relationships between parties before allowing access and sharing information. Masquerading as a party known to be a trusted uh, agent by a target system is frequently a frequently used method of defeating network security. There are many other cyber methods that involve violations of the trust relationship, but addressed here are variations on phishing, internet protocol spoofing, and domain name spoofing. And these are mentioned as a way of contextualizing and exploring these rules. First is the use of phishing, a type of social engineering to manipulate authorized system users into providing information and thus allowing unauthorized system access. This manipulation occurs in the cyber context through the use of email, e-messaging, or online communications. The Talon International Group of Experts, the IGE, addressed this situation, citing the example of an adversary sending an email with the bare assertion that the sender is a delegate of the International Committee of the Red Cross. The IGE found no misuse in this example, despite the use of the words Red Cross. Although GC1 Article 44 specifically protects these words from unauthorized use, the presumed argument is that the operator's use of the words Red Cross is not formal enough to be considered as an emblematic identifier. However, if the words were employed in a more formal manner, such as in an email signature block, letterhead to an attachment, or another manner formally indicating an official Red Cross document, there is a much stronger argument that the use violates the GC1 Article 44 prohibition. The second type of operation is a related type of phishing campaign, but with the aim of tricking the target operator into taking cyber-based self-defeating actions. This method uses social media messaging and websites to induce the target into either downloading malicious attachments or following web links to malicious websites. Like other types of social engineering, these attacks rely on the target operator trusting the email, website, or attachment such that they will take the desired action. Protected emblems could easily be implanted into the email, message, or website to induce trust in the target. As the actual protected emblem would clearly be used in such an unauthorized manner, this is a clear IHL violation. The Talon IGE came to the same conclusion on this question. A third method illustrating misuse of emblems is IP spoofing, or internet protocol spoofing. Here, cyber operators attempt to gain unauthorized system access by creating a malicious message that appears to originate from a trusted machine imitating its IP address. For example, spoofing an IP address associated with the ICRC to defeat a firewall that relies on IP addresses for filtering. The primary question is whether IP addresses should be viewed as a legal indicator of a protected organization. This appears logical given the widespread use of IP addresses as trust indicator by cyber operators. For example, a defensive operator may specifically program a firewall to permit connections from ICRC or UN IP addresses during an armed conflict. These connections may allow communications regarding the treatment of wounded or prisoners of war. If an adversary were to spoof these IP addresses, the network operator may be forced to block communications from these previously trusted sources. Permitting a party to a conflict to represent a communication as coming from the ICRC or UN appears to run counter to the intent of IHL. Article 31 of the Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties states that a treaty should be interpreted partly in the light of its object and purpose. However, the same treaty also states that treaties should be interpreted 
in accordance with the ordinary meaning to be given to the terms of the treaty in their context. Provisions governing use of the emblems suggest an element of general awareness or recognition of the emblem as such. Thus, it is unlikely that a spoofed ICRC IP address could be considered as an imitation of the emblem under Article, 33, Article 53 standard, given the lack of general awareness as to what the sequence of numbers in an IP address specifically indicates. The fourth method for analysis involves the spoofing of email addresses or domain names. By spoofing an email address such as IC, at icrc.org in the recipient's from field, the operator hopes to induce either the target system to allow the email through the firewall or a target individual to trust the contents of the email. Once this trust is established, the operator may then use that connection to conduct the next phase of a cyber operation. Similarly, a domain name system hijacking operation may send an unwitting target who access uh, the icrc.org or un.org websites to a spoofed website containing malicious links or false information. Here, the focus is on domain names which serve to provide users with a recognizable identity to resources found on the internet. Although related to IP addresses, domain names differ in that they often contain an organization's name or abbreviation, as opposed to the numerical designator of an IP address. The narrower protection for the UN emblem, which does not include the name United Nations or approximations, eliminates its applicability from this analysis. The relevant question as to the Red Cross is whether a spoofed email address or domain name containing the words Red Cross the acronym ICRC or similar abbreviation would constitute an imitation thereof. The TAL and IGE struggled with the issue and laid out two potential approaches. The first approach argued that the email address and domain names are not protected indicators because they do not constitute electronic reproductions of the relevant graphic emblems. This approach may overlook the prohibitions in Article 44 and 53 on the unauthorized use of the words Red Cross or an imitation thereof when they function as an indicative or protective emblem. The second approach found the key factor to be the use of an indicator upon which others would reasonably rely in extending protection provided for under the law of armed conflict. Thus, the imitation of the icrc.org domain name or email address would be an unauthorized use because, as the IGE states, it invites confidence as to the affiliation of the originator. Although the IG does not reference Article 53, this view would be consistent with that article's inclusion of any sign or designation constituting an imitation thereof. Given the ubiquitous use of the acronym ICRC, it would be hard to argue that it does not constitute an imitation thereof. Therefore, the second approach of the IG appears to be a more accurate reflection of IHL. The various, me various methods of phishing and spoofing are not the only types of cyber operations that implicate the rules against misuse of protected emblems. However, they highlight methods in which protected indicators might be used in a remote access cyber operation. They also serve to help identify which cyber indicators could constitute protected indicators and reveal gaps where adversaries could take advantage of the trusted nature of organizations such as the ICRC and UN to conduct offensive cyber operations. Thank you very much for your time, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you. And our, our third presenter is Professor Wolf Heinstel von Heinig, who holds the Chair of Public Law at the Europa Universitat Viadrina in Frankfurt, Germany. He's also a former Charles H. Stockton Professor of International Law at the uh, US Naval College, and he contributed to Talon 2 on the international law applicable to cyber operations. I'm looking forward to hearing this presentation. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, let me first of all thank the organizers for having invited me to this very interesting and I think important workshop. I am Wolf Heintrich von Heineck from Germany and um, I have been tasked to talk about cyber blockades. Um, but before I start, I would like to clarify some ba basic issues. So when I'm talking about cyberspace, I'm not using any of the proposed definitions. But 
as the Joint Chiefs of Staff of the United States. I'm looking at cyberspace uh, from the perspective of the three layers model. But irrespective of all of this, it is quite clear that the special char characteristics of cyberspace are, of course, interconnectivity and ubiquity. Now, when it comes to the notion of cyber operations, I'm again making use of the recent DOD Law of War manual. So we are talking about cyber operations if and to the extent we are employing cyber capabilities with the primary purpose of achieving objectives in or through cyberspace. One of these or two of these objectives could be the disruption or the denial of data or information resident in the respective target systems. So this begs the question of whether the disruption or denial of data to a given state or from a given state would qualify as a cyber blockade. Well, of course, if what you see here on the world's map are the world's IP addresses. And of course, arguably denying the access or the transmission of data, let's say to the US East Coast or the transmission from the US East Coast to other countries could arguably qualify as a blockade. But let us first look at what a blockade is. A blockade is a method of warfare. Of course, it is characterized by a line, in the case of naval warfare, which other vessels may not cross, either from the inside or from the outside. The consequence of any such breach of blockade would be the capture of the vessel. The same holds true for aerial blockades, this Despite of the fact that aerial blockades were only considered as being a method of air warfare recently. The sources uh, which apply to blockades, naval and air blockades, are, as you can see, considerably old. We have to go back to the 1856 Paris Declaration, then we have two uh, informal documents like, such as the 1909 London Declaration, just one provision of the Oxford Manual of 1913, arguably Article 70 of the Additional Protocol, at least for the state's parties to that treaty, would be applicable to blockades. And then again, we have two private drafts, the 1994 San Remo Manual on the Law of Naval Warfare, which more or less repeats uh, the rules of the 1909 London Declaration and the 1856 Paris Declaration. And finally, the 2009 Air and Missile Warfare Manual on Aerial Blockades. What all these rules have in common are the following requirements. Blockades must be declared and notified. They must be applied, that means also enforced impartially, including your own aircraft and your own vessels. They may be maintained by a combination of all lawful means of warfare. And the blockade is valid only if it is effective, which of course is a question of fact. Access to neutral territory may not be barred. And there are two further uh, requirements of a humanitarian design, which are not all too relevant for cyber. So can we imagine uh, a situation to which these traditional rules uh, that have been developed for naval and area blockades to apply to a cyber blockade? Well, of course, arguably the prevention of egress or ingress of data traffic and information to and from the parts of an enemy state 
would arguably qualify as something which would deserve the name cyber blockade. If you look at some of those who propose uh, the notion of cyber blockade to have become part and parcel of international law, they are referring, first of all, to the 2007 cyber DDoS attacks against Estonia. And secondly, they are referring to the 2008 cyber operations against Georgia in its armed conflict with the Russian Federation. And in fact, in that conflict, we had again DDoS attacks, quite sophisticated, and we had a defacement of public websites. And what is more interesting, uh, Georgia's internet traffic was blocked or could be blocked almost entirely because it was then depending on rules through the Russian Federation. Now, if we took the position that any of these situations qualified as a cyber blockade, then the law of blockade would have to be observed. In other words, such a blockade needs to be declared and notified. It must be enfor enforced impartially and in order to be valid, it must be effective. In other words, there must be a high probability that all data can no longer be transmitted from or to the blockaded territory. And this is already reflected in the law as it stands today. What about a cyber operation which merely has internal effects, such in the case of the DDoS attacks against Estonia or Georgia? And finally, just consider the cutting of a submarine communication cable that would compromise the connectivity of the target state. Would ever that have been qualified as a blockade or as an operation subject to the rules that were drafted for naval or aerial blockades? Well, if you look at the Tallinn manual, uh, you may be very disappointed. Of course, some of the experts believe that there were some similarities between a traditional blockade and a cyber operation that would at least deny the transmission of data to or from a given state. But at the end of the day, the international group of experts was not able to arrive at any consensus. So the only rules they provided in the Tallinn Manual 2.0 was traditional blockades, which are enforced, including by cyber means. But the experts were not able to arrive at a consensus according to which a concept of a cyber blockade would already be part of international law as it exists today. And let me add that it's never a good idea to draw conclusions by analogy. This was already done in 1923 with the Hague Rules on Air Warfare, where the experts there simply copied and pasted the law of naval warfare, and they replaced the term vessel with aircraft, and then they suddenly uh, presented the 1923 Hague Rules on Air Warfare. However, as Spade has rightly stated in 1947, without any precedents, without any cases, without any state practice that would allow any of the conclusions they arrived at in 1923. So I think we simply have to be patient. We should not hurry uh, to apply some rules of the traditional law of armed conflict only because of some similarities with the interception of aircraft and vessels. Accordingly, the Lex Lata is to be understood as follows. The concept of cyber blockade has not yet been recognized and has not yet become part and parcel of the law of armed conflict. The prevention of data transmission into or from a given country is, in other words, lawful. And if at all, subject to only a few 
legal restrictions, such as the rules on submarine, submarine cables. But let me remind you, the only provision on submarine cables is Article 54 of the 1907 Hague Regulations. So for the time being, any interference with the transmission of data to or from an enemy state in an international armed conflict is not subject to the rules applicable to traditional naval or area blockades. I thank you for your attention and I'm looking forward to the discussion. Gentlemen, thank you very much for your uh, very interesting uh, presentation this evening. Um, I think we'll kick off with a question to Cuba, if I may. Uh, picking up on your example you gave a little bit earlier in relation to the hacking of a humanitarian uh, convoy. Uh, can you elaborate on that a little, please? Because uh, I'm interested, if, if that isn't falling within perfidy, uh, what rules of international humanitarian law do you think may have been convened in those circumstances? Okay, thank you for the question. Uh, so that relates to the sort of middle example that I mentioned during my talk. So we had this example of uh, a phone app that's developed by a humanitarian organization, and then the belligerents hack into the application to, uh, to achieve a military advantage through misleading the beneficiaries of this app. Now, like I said, this would not amount to a prohibited perfidy, but the rules that we would consider would be, I think, first and foremost, and that would be irrespective of which uh, humanitarian organization it would be, as long as it would be considered an independent and an impartial, so truly humanitarian organization, would be the obligation to respect and protect humanitarian personnel. Because this application is meant to be used by humanitarian personnel, and so if someone takes control over it and uses it to the detriment, that then leads to the loss of trust in the provider of the application by the beneficiaries. And of course, it also interferes with the, uh, with the, with the activities of the humanitarian organization. But uh, I think uh, what can be more interesting, and then there is an overlap with uh, Jeff's excellent presentation, is whether it could also amount to a misuse of protective indicators. And so this is something that we looked into in the scenario, but then it would depend which uh, organization we are talking about. So if it was, as in the cyber law toolkit scenario that I referred to, if the application was indeed run by the ICRC and it would use the, the nomination Red Cross in the application's name, then there are two interpretations. And so we detail that in the scenario, but it's interesting to consider that by taking control over the uh, application, the hackers thus are, at least on the one interpretation, are for the duration of their malicious cyber activity, they are utilizing this denomination, denomination Red Cross, in a way that would not be uh, consistent with Article 44, Paragraph 1 of the First Geneva Convention. And thus, under this interpretation, it would also amount to a violation of IHL. So there are other rules that it also depends on what exactly happens in practice, like the prohibition on, human, on the use of human shields. But uh, I think I would highlight those two as the primary ones. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. Um, if, I, if I can pose a question to, to Wolf, please. Um, the question we have is if a state successfully manages to prevent the transmission of data in and out of another state outside of the confines of an armed conflict, would you consider that such action would amount to armed attack, triggering, sorry, triggering a state's right of self-defense? Sorry, Professor, we've got you on. Uh, we've got you on silent. I'm so sorry. Um, yeah, I'm getting too old for this. Um, so I apologize. So uh, triggering the right of self-defense would require an armed attack. So blocking data traffic into or from a country, well, hardly qualifies as an armed attack that would trigger the respective state's right of self-defense. And uh, remember, it needs to be an armed attack. And if you follow the, IC, uh, the ICJ, it would mean that it would be a very grave form of a use of force. And uses of force 
uh, as uh, was stated by Ro Roy Schoendorf in his keynote, uh, they all require at least some damage, destruction, injury, or death. So the mere blocking of data may result in inconvenience, but would certainly not have the effects of a traditional use of force of a sufficient gravity to qualify as an armed attack. Thank you for your uh, comprehensive answer. Um, uh, I think we have a couple of questions in the Q&A now, if I can just turn to one. Um, if I open up to, to generally to the panel, the question is, is reasoning by analogy that is applying an existing rule to an unregulated issue to the extent of the similarities between the two issues on a legally relevant point, not a usual form of legal reasoning common to all legal systems and subscribed to the rule of law? Is, is it not based on the concept of equality before law and the idea of justice? And so looking there at uh, taking what we have already in international law and applying it to cyberspace to see if we, we get to equality rules. Um, I would imagine that's more aimed at the idea of blockade. So perhaps, Wolf, if you take that to begin with. Yes, analogy is common to many, maybe even all legal systems, but to use analogy in international law is, I think, not a good idea. Uh, international law must always be based on a sufficient consensus of states. And even though you may be able, in theory, to identify a gap as, for example, with regard to cyber operations, that does not mean that you can borrow from existing rules only because there are some similarities. Because even if you accept it, which I don't, the concept of analogy in international law, then you would still have to identify that the gap has been un unintended and had the states uh, to, to taken notice of the gap, they would have regulated in a similar manner as they did in other areas. And I don't think that you can apply that in international law. So it simply doesn't work. And if you don't mind my hopping in, I, I would definitely agree with, with Wolf on what he just said. And I would also add that um, if you were, however, to do that analogy, I would think you would want there to be um, significantly uh, similar circumstances in order to achieve that analogy. And the question with cyber is, it, are, are cyber operations so fundam fundamentally different than other types of military operations that the analogy just breaks down too quickly? Um, and, I, and I do think that's the case. I think there's such significant differences um, in, in how cyber operations work, how they're conducted, um, you know, all the issues that we've talked about today, right? The, the tangibility of, of data, um, the ideas of, of attacks, these are all such fundamentally different things in the cyber domain that even if you were to argue that you could reason by analogy, I think in this case, um, it's just too attenuated and the analogy would break down too quickly. Thank you. Kubo, uh, do you have anything on this point at all? Sure, yeah, I'm happy to come in. Uh, so uh, let me try to advance a slightly different uh, approach. Uh, and uh, I'm putting off my head uh, as a ICRC representative and kind of uh, I'll admit to being a recovering academic. So um, my view of international law is that it's a, a harmonious system and, uh, the, and states, uh, and we cannot only expect states to uh, approach it on a very casuistic basis. International law does have also general rules of interpretation that states have agreed on. And uh, those, and so, you know, some of them are now considered to be reflective of customary international law. For example, the treaty interpretation rules that we find in the Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties. And perhaps we're not saying different things here, but uh, I, I, would, uh, I would argue that we cannot be so casuistic as to always expect that there would be a singular uh, state practice and opinion juris for every situation that might occur. And so, because that's uh, unrealistic, we also have these general approaches, general principles, general ways of reasoning and of interpreting agreed rules. And thus, uh, we might arrive to interpretations also without there being specific amount of opinions and, uh, and, and practice on a, every given situation. So that's uh, my two points on this question. 
Gentlemen, thank you all so much for your contributions. I'm being told uh, that we are actually out of time, um, but I'm sure that the, uh, the questions that are asked in the Q&A box can be archived and maybe can be presented to you in a different format for you to engage with at a later point. Can I, can I thank you for your uh, involvement today though and for your, your very interesting observations. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you for all our panelists. Um, we'll now take a short break and reconvene um, at 14.30 hours, so about nine minutes. Okay, well, welcome back. Um, last but by certainly no means least, uh, we have our final panel today, which um, is, co uh, is with one of our co-sponsors here for the conference, the US Air Force uh, Academy. Um, very excited to hear what the panelists have got to say on this issue. Uh, and let me first introduce uh, our moderator today, uh, is Lieutenant Colonel Timothy Goines, who came to the Air Force in 2004. He currently serves as a senior military faculty assistant professor of law at the US Air Force Academy. And it's there that he teaches cyber law and serves as the director of the Law, Technology and Warfare Research Cell. So, sir, over to you. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. Uh, first, on behalf of the United States Air Force Academy, I want to thank the Stockton Center for hosting this week's conference and for inviting a number of us to participate. Thank you especially to Lieutenant Colonel Cherry and Squadron Leader Tinkler for their efforts this week in hosting what has been thus far a fantastic conference. For the third of three panels on cyber operations, we will begin by addressing the evolving state practice in cyber operations. As cyber capabilities near ubiquity, we are starting to see more and more states beginning to provide their views on how international law applies to cyber operations. For example, New Zealand recently published a position paper on the topic, and as you heard in this morning's presentation, Dr. Scheindorf spoke about Israel's position regarding the application of international law to cyber operations, specifically addressing topics such as whether data is an object, sovereignty, countermeasures, among others. As Dr. Scheindorf analogized it, this area of the law, it's like a tree, a nascent seedling just now growing roots. So it's very timely for us to discuss how state practice is evolving and how this tree is starting to function. We have three great panelists for our discussion. First is Professor Eric Talbot Jensen, a former Army judge advocate who is currently serving as a professor of law at Brigham Young University. Over to the Stockton Center for Professor Jensen's initial remarks. Hello, my name is Eric Talbot Jensen and I am a professor at Brigham Young University Law School. I am happy to be a part of this conference on disruptive technology and international law. And I'm especially grateful to be part of this panel on evolving state practice and cyber operations. I'd like to start by sharing my screen with you and walking you through some slides. This, this conference, but especially this panel deals with uh, disruptive technologies as you know. Now, when we think of disruptive technologies, there are lots of things we could think about. Autonomous systems, artificial intelligence, neuromorphic weapons, human brain machine interface, bioenhancement, virology, nanotechnology, quantum computing. All of these things uh, may be considered disruptive technologies, and some have been the topic, uh, pre some have been on the top of the topics previously discussed in this conference. My task, however, is to talk to you about cyber operations. And I believe that of all these innovations, cyber tools are in a special category with respect to disruptive technologies. To do that, I want to, to convince you of that. I wanna take you for a brief moment into the business world. You see there a picture of Professor Clayton M. Christensen from the Harvard Business School. He introduced to the world this idea of disruptive innovation. And I'll let you read the slide that describes what disruptive innovation is. I want to draw your attention to the fact that the innovation is not a breakthrough in technology. Rather, the thing that makes the innovation disruptive is that it makes products that previously were not accessible now accessible and affordable to people. In other words, it's not a leap forward in science, but rather making those innovations, those scientific innovations broadly accessible. 
As this slide reflects, it's the simplicity, convenience, accessibility, and affordability of innovation that is most important. The impact is not because of a movement forward, rather because of a movement across the field. Now here are three factors that make innovation disruptive. So I've given three examples here, the long life light bulb, the personal computer, the smartphone. These innovations are, they were not really leaps forward in and of themselves. It was really their accessibility that made them disruptive. The fact that now all of us had access to those kinds of tools. So let me bring this back to cyber operations. You see, I have two pictures there, one a hacker, uh, one a tank. Not many of us have neighbors who have tanks parked in their driveway or battleships, or carriers, or Aegis cruisers, or F-16s, et cetera. Those kinds of, of tools require state-level resources. On the other hand, cyber tools don't require state-level resources. Really, cyber tools can, are accessible to certainly to criminal gangs, to, to transnational criminal gangs, to terrorist groups, and even to individuals. This devolution of state-level violence through cyber tools to non-state actors and even individuals has forced states to seriously think about what that impact will be on national security. So this really brings me to the topic of the panel, which is how has this disruptive cyber technology impacted state practice? Well, here's what I believe. Now, let me be clear. I am not one of those who is calling for new law or thinks current law is in, in, inadequate. However, what we do see through state practice uh, is that states are starting to look at fundamental principles of international law in a different way because of this uh, disruptive technology of cyber operations. So I, this course is, well, let me back up. If, if I don't think that we need new law, what do we do? Well, we evolve the law through state practice. Again, I think just on the fringes, but we evolve the law through state practice. So I wanna focus us on state practice and I wanna particularly look at US state practice. And, and I, I know most of you are very well aware of these provisions, but let me briefly walk through uh, these five provisions that I think reflect current US practice. The first is the 2018 US Cyber Command Strategic Vision. And let me just read that to you. Superiority through persistence seizes and maintains the initiative in cyberspace by continuously engaging and contesting adversaries and causing them uncertainty wherever they maneuver. It describes how we operate, maneuvering seamlessly between defense and offense across the internet interconnected battle space. It describes where we operate globally as close as possible to adversaries in their operations. It describes when we operate continuously shaping the battle space. It describes why we operate to create operational advantage for us while denying the same to our adversaries. Now this strategic vision, really uh, think about the, the idea of wherever they maneuver and where we, where we operate is globally. This was followed by some, uh, the, the 2019 National Defense Authorization Act. And there are three specific provisions I would like to draw your attention to. First, section 1632. It, Section 1632 really does two things. First, it provides expanded authority to conduct military operations in cyberspace. And again, let me just read what, what uh, the Section A says. The Secretary of Defense shall develop, prepare, and coordinate, make ready all armed forces for purposes of, and when appropriately authorized to do so, conduct military cyber activities or operations in cyberspace, including clandestine military activities or operations in cyberspace to defend the United States and its allies, including in response to malicious cyber activity carried out against the United States or United States person by a foreign power. Second, and for those of you involved in intelligence law, this will be especially meaningful. Uh, Section C says a clandestine military activity or operation in cyberspace shall be considered a traditional military activity for the purposes of, and then it lists a couple of sections of Title 50. So this is transitioning what might have been argued were intelligence activities under Title 50 requiring intelligence oversight into traditional military activities, making cyber common, the Department of Defense more generally, much more 
uh, giving them much more freedom of maneuver with respect to the use of cyber activities. Let me transition to section 1636, also accomplishing two important things. First, it clearly states the policy of the United States on cyber war, cyber security, and cyber warfare. Here is what it says. Quote, it shall be the policy of the United States with respect to matters pertaining to cyberspace, cybersecurity, and cyber warfare that the United States should employ all instruments of national power, including the use of offensive cyber capabilities to deter if possible and respond to when necessary all cyber attacks or other malicious cyber activities of foreign powers that target the United States. Second, Section 1636 directs the DOD to operate in such a way that it would impose costs on adversaries. Here's what uh, section, subsection D says, quote, in carrying out the policy set forth in subsection A, which is what I just read to you, through response operations developed pursuant to subsection B, the United States shall develop and when appropriate, demonstrate or otherwise make known to adversaries the existence of cyber capabilities to impose costs on any foreign power targeting the United States or United States persons with a cyber attack or malicious cyber activity described in subsection A. We'll come back to that idea of imposing costs. Finally, Section 1642 creates what many of us have termed as a mini AUMF. This provision applies specifically to four countries, Russia, China, North Korea, and Iran. And it specifically uh, gives Cyber Command the authority to, quote, take appropriate and proportional action in foreign cyberspace to disrupt, defeat, and deter such attacks under the authority and policy of the Secretary of Defense to conduct cyber operations, information operations, as traditional military activities. Then finally, in March of 2020, uh, the, DOD, the DOD General Counsel, Mr. Paul Nye, uh, made this statement. Uh, he said, a key element of the US military strategy in the face of these cyber threats is to defend forward. Implementing this element of this strategy begins with continuously engaging and contesting adversaries and causing them uncertainty wherever they maneuver, which we refer to as persistent engagement. Now, to me, this combination of recent US practice seems to promote a trend of being much more aggressive with respect to cyber activities and not just at home, but also abroad. In that same 2019 NDAA in section uh, 1652, Congress created a Cyberspace Solarium Commission. Oops, wrong way. Cyberspace Solarium Commission, here we go. And uh, that commission was specifically tasked to, quote, develop a consensus on a strategic approach to defending the United States cyberspace against cyber attacks of significant, significant consequences. This Cyberspace Solarium Commission was designed after a similar commission in the early days of the Cold War. And it was really, uh, established to figure out how we could, as a, a whole of nation approach, begin to defend better and to deter our adversaries. The commission included congressional and executive branch representatives, as well as representatives from the private sector. The report was released in March 2020, and the report advocates a strategic approach based on three themes, shape behavior, denied benefits, impose costs. Again, remember, impose costs from the NDAA section that I mentioned. One of the key factors in this strategic approach is layered cyber defense that embraces DOD's defend forward posture as essential to effective deterrence. Now here's a quote from the Cyber Solarium Commission with respect to defend forward. The report goes on to, def to define defend forward in this way. That wording I've highlighted in yellow seems important to me because it is, in a sense, a summation of all of the, the prior uh, recent US practice I showed you. To defend forward, we must be uh, proactive in observing and pursuing and countering adversary operations and imposing costs, again, not just on our own networks, but on networks of others. So how do we do this? Well, we can't do it from our own networks. We must be outside our own networks and on the networks of others but that might cause significant legal implications, which I hope we will get to in the question and answer period. Let me just sum up by saying where I think we are with current US practice. First, 
uh, the United States must be, including the Department of Defense, must be proactively operating on foreign infrastructure. And I, again, I don't have access to classified information, though some of you do. I believe that now with this change, we are proactively operating on foreign infrastructure. We act by permission where feasible, but by action where not. We act in conjunction with allies and partners where possible, but alone where not. We have an increased willingness to attribute harmful cyber activities. And I, you've seen that reflected in recent uh, statements on attribution to various countries be, who have been involved in malicious cyber behavior. I would not term it as gloves off, meaning no rules, but I would say this more aggressive stance is a challenge to use our gloves, to get involved in the fight, and again, to take the fight to our adversaries. Now, I appreciate your patience with my slides. Uh, I am looking forward to questions and answers, and I uh, hope to talk with you in life, in real life here in just a moment. Thank you, Professor Jensen. Second, we have Professor Ashley Deeks, who previously served as a legal advisor in the Department of State and who is currently the E. James Kelly Jr. Class of 1965 Research Professor and the Director of the National Security Law Center at the University of Virginia Law School. Back to the Stockton Center for Professor Deeks' initial remarks. Hi, uh, thank you for having me join this uh, this great conference. I'm delighted to be a part of it. Uh, I am engaged in a broader project that is framed around this idea of a double black box. Uh, in the United States, national security is in many ways a uh, black box. It is hard for Congress to oversee and regulate a range of intelligence and military actions. Uh, as many of you know, courts tend to be highly deferential. And classification issues mean that we're forced to rely on alternatives such as leaks, uh, internal executive checks, uh, uh, constraints imposed by foreign allies, and even private companies these days that interact with the executive behind the veil of secrecy. And even with those alternative checks, we're still in a highly imperfect system. So the goal of my project is to explore how adding tools uh, such as those of machine learning, uh, specifically and artificial intelligence more generally, into the national security ecosystem will exacerbate uh, or what I'm calling double the existing black box problem that we uh, run into in national security. So machine learning can, for example, exacerbate citizens' abilities to know what's being done in our name. Uh, and it may also exacerbate the ability of our usual proxies to uh, know and to understand what the executive is doing. It may even undercut the strengths of some of these other tools that we rely on, such as leaks, uh, interagency negotiations, the role of general counsels, uh, and so on. And yet, I think many people in this room might agree that we are going to come under lots of pressure to adopt these tools in the military and intelligence setting because states like Russia and China seem very firmly committed to them. So how do we pursue these tools in a way that ensures that our executive branch pursues, uh, pursues these tools while remaining faithful to our public law values. So my inquiry is more of a domestic law inquiry than an international law one, but international law obviously is a, a, a big factor in preserving those public law values by uh, making decisions that continue to adhere to, to international law um, in the use and value and use in bellow space. Further, while the project is uh, focused on the double black box inside the United States, the challenge it captures, I think, is likely also to hold true for a range of democratic states that are thinking about increasing their use of uh, machine learning in this space. So how does this relate to cyber? Well, I, I recently uh, wrote an article in International Law Studies, um, thanks to the Naval War College, that uses the looming likelihood of autonomous cyber operations to try to test some of these arguments. So one premise of, um, of the piece, and others have suggested this as well, is that we're likely to see a growing use of autonomous tools in the cyber setting, both in offense and in defense. Now, there's admittedly a diversity of views about the likelihood of inadvertent escalation in cyberspace above the use of force threshold. Um, but the possibility of what we might think of as flash crashes 
um, seems realistic when we're talking about two cyber algorithms that are uh, confronting each other uh, and haven't encountered each other before. We know that uh, this kind of escalation took place uh, in the stock market setting. Once we're thinking about the possibility of that kind of escalation, it's important to consider the existing roles of parliaments and legislatures in regulating states' resort to force. There are three main ways that parliaments tend to be involved in decisions about extraterritorial uses of force. Uh, they can authorize force ex ante, they can authorize force ex post, and they can provide ongoing oversight and funding to the operations. So why do we value legislative involvement in use of force decisions? Well, it creates an ob obvious avenue by which we can hold executive branches democratically accountable for their force related decisions. And there's also a body of literature that suggests that uh, legislative involvement can help states avoid bad wars. But of course, for legislators to do their jobs, they need to have access to a certain flow of information and they need to possess some level of competence to understand the tools that they're confronted with by their executive branches. For some legislatures, that is a big challenge. Um, and even relatively big and well-funded committees, such as those in the US Congress, have faced problems of getting full access to information about policies, legal interpretations, and technologies that the executive branch uh, in the US is using. And in some systems, the executive has a wide range of discretion to resort to force extraterritorially unless the level of armed force being deployed is significant. So against that background, how will growing cyber autonomy impact the role of legislatures? Um, how will it affect the ability of democracies to ensure that decisions to resort to force remain careful and deliberate choices? Well, I think it'll potentially do at least three things. First, it might empower further uh, executive branches at the expense of legislatures. Legislators will have less time to weigh in, especially once cyber exchanges begin. Uh, legislators might suffer greater informational deficits about the fact that these autonomous systems exist, uh, as well as about what their capabilities are. Uh, and it may be harder to audit operations ex post to understand what transpired, especially where the tools involve the use of um, machine learning or deep learning. Second, it could empower militaries at the expense of other ministries, such as the foreign ministries, justice ministries, these other actors that often have a role to play in national security decisions. That said, I do think there's some possibility that the growth of algorithm-driven decision-making could uh, actually centralize interagency conversations. Uh, if those other ministries recognize that the, uh, the operations driven by machine learning will implicate laws of war, domestic legal and policy issues, and the lawyers in those ministries um, seek a role at the table in, in, in making these interpretations of domestic law and international law as the algorithms are being structured on the front end. Uh, a third thing that I think this uh, development could do is it might end up empowering computer scientists at the expense of other actors inside these agencies, such as lawyers, um, such as policymakers. So overall, unless carefully managed, I think the major concern is that cyber autonomy might increase the, the number of bad or inadvertent conflicts. Uh, in a way that would be reduced if there were uh, consistent and continued legislative involvement. So how do we address this challenge, these challenges? First, you could see legislators doing more work to actually legislate things like the algorithm's parameters in advance. So they could, for example, require that in most instances, operations being driven by autonomous uh, cyber systems be reversible. Uh, they might demand uh, to, that the, the executives try to um, uh, make their algorithms a white, white boxes rather than black boxes. Um, and they could even demand that the executives share information with them about where they have prepositioned tools inside other states' systems. Um, legislatures could also establish cyber-specific oversight committees uh, that, that gain a level of sophistication uh, about these tools. Um, and third, you could have uh, the interagency itself collectively develop rules of engagement rather than leave that entirely to militaries or military lawyers. 
Um, and in terms of the relevance of international law, um, if NATO states are all going to confront these issues, then I think it's critical to increase the level of detail of the conversations that states inside NATO have been having about the interactions, potential interactions among autonomous cyber tools and to start to clarify at least among each other when those interactions will rise to a level that implicates the use ad bellum. Great, thank you, Professor Deeks. Finally, we have Professor Pashemek Roguski. He's a lecturer in law at Jagiellonian University in Krakow, Poland, and an expert on cybersecurity and international law at the Pushtushka Institute. Back over to the Stockton Center for Professor Roguski's initial remarks. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Przemysław Roguski, and it is both an honor and privilege to speak to you at this great conference and in such an illustrious panel. The topic of my talk today will be the topic of collective countermeasures against cyber attacks. And I would like to start by inviting you to consider the following scenario. Now let's imagine that state A's electric power grid and hospitals are targeted by a prolonged ransomware campaign, which as it turns out, is being directed by state B. Now state A on its own lacks sufficient cyber capabilities to make state B stop. However, it has powerful allies, states C and D, and it asks those allies to help. The question then becomes whether states C and D, which are not themselves directly injured by the ransomware campaign, can nevertheless intervene on behalf of state A by instituting countermeasures against state B, either in real world, for instance, by severing trade ties, trans transportation links, and so forth, or in cyberspace by uh, targeting state B's cyber infrastructure in order to induce it to stop attacking state A. Now, this topic has become prominent in the last one and a half years because it has been taken up by states. It was first taken up by Estonia uh, during the Cyclon Conference 2015 when President Kresti Kanulaj, while presenting Estonia's position on international law in cyberspace, has stated, and I quote, that Estonia is furthering the position that states which are not directly injured may apply countermeasures to support the state directly affected by the malicious cyber operation. Several months later, France responded, and it responded in its document on international law applicable to operation in cyberspace by stating that, and I quote again, collective countermeasures are not authorized, which rules out the possibility of France taking such measures in response to an infringement of another state's rights. But the question then becomes, well, which of those two statements is correct with respect to international law as it stands today? And we should perhaps begin by defining what we mean by countermeasures. So if we look at the law of international uh, responsibility, we will see that the countermeasures are actions by a state which normally would constitute an international wrongful act or violate an international obligation of that state, but whose wrongfulness is precluded precisely because they are taken in response to a previous international wrongful act of another state and directed against that state with the aim of inducing that state to stop its initial violation. Now, under international law, uh, countermeasures can be taken by the injured or victim state. And this is because Enforcement under international law is essentially a bilateral nature uh, within the law of uh, state responsibility. Only the states whose interests are being directly affected can um, request the responsible state to stop, can invoke uh, the responsibility of that state, as we say. So the question is, well, do third states have any role in such constellations? And if we look at the articles on state responsibility, which are, uh, reflect the customary law in this regard, we will see that other states can invoke the responsibility of the attacking state only in limited circumstances. Namely, only if the obligation that has been breached is owed to a group of states, not to one state individually, but to a group of states. And crucially, it is established for the protection of a collective interest of the group and not of an individual interest of the victim state. And we would call them ergo omnis partis obligations. Or 
if the obligation that is being breached is owed to the international community as a whole, and we would call that ergo omnis obligation. There is a further uh, limitation or difficulty, namely under the articles on state responsibility, even in those limited circumstances, third states can invoke the responsibility of non uh, of uh, the responsible state only to call for the cessation of that act and to demand the performance of reparation to the benefit of the injured state. The articles themselves do not mention countermeasures as such, and this is because there has been a discussion within the International Law Commission when those articles have been drafted, whether those third party countermeasures are permissible or not. But there has been inserted a back door uh, in Article 54, namely, which says that uh, this chapter does not prejudice the, the right of any third state uh, to take lawful measures against the responsible state. And so the question is well, would countermeasures fall under this definition of lawful measures? Now, this question has been studied recently, uh, and I will invoke here two major studies from 2010 and 2017, which both come to the conclusion that state practice and opinion juris is sufficiently widespread and uniform to suggest that uh, third party or collective countermeasures are permitted under customary international law. However, and crucially, it is permitted only within those confines of Article 48. So they are only permitted against violations of ergo omnis or ergo omnis partis obligations, not against violations of individual obligations protecting individual interests of a particular state. So the follow-up question is then, well, can cyber attacks violate collective obligations? And if we take a look at uh, obligations are gone or are gone as part is, as they have been identified in the jurisprudence of the International Court of Justice. We will see such obligations as the prohibition of aggression or genocide, the prohibition of slavery or racial discrimination. But I believe you will agree with me that those are not the obligations that are typically affected by cyber attacks and constellations such as the initial scenario. Rather, Obligations that are most likely to be violated by cyber attacks are, for instance, the obligation of non-intervention or the duty to respect the territorial sovereignty of another state, if indeed you believe that such a duty exists and is applicable to cyberspace, or perhaps due diligence, and so forth. So obligations that are targeted or violated by cyber attacks usually are there to protect individual interests of states, not collective interests of the international community or groups of states as evidenced and by those examples given from the jurisprudence of the International Court of Justice. Well, so the follow-up question would be, are there perhaps cyber-specific collective obligations uh, that the International Court of Justice has not known so far? And I would argue that there are none. However, there are certain candidates uh, from uh, non-binding norms, which may, given time and given sufficient state practice and opinion juries, harden into binding collective obligations. And I would uh, propose two. The first one is the norm to protect the public core of the internet, which has been discussed in many fora and has been proposed, for instance, by the Paris Call in principle two, and has found its way already in legislation uh, in the European Union. And if this uh, becomes more widespread and more uh, states adopt such legislation, uh, followed by opinion juries, this could well uh, in, evolve into a cyber-specific collective obligation. The second one is the norm not to attack critical infrastructures such as hospitals or vaccine research facilities, which is reflected in Norm 13F of the UNGGE report in 2015. And uh, in these pandemic times, uh, I believe it is in the interest of uh, the international community as a whole to protect those critical uh, infrastructures and not only uh, does this protect the individual interest of a particular state. So allow me to come to my conclusions of this brief survey. And the first conclusion would be that international law, as it currently stands, allows for collective countermeasures but only against those actions, including cyber attacks, which violate norms established to protect collective interests. 
And given that most cyber attacks, as we have seen, do not violate such norms, but rather violate norms that are uh, there to protect individual interests by states, the consequence would be that under international law, as it currently stands, collective countermeasures are not permitted against most cyber attacks, simply because this requirement of a violation of a collective interest or norm to, establish, to protect a collective interest, rather, is not fulfilled. Now, international law could develop to include such cyber-specific collective interest norms as the ones discussed previously, but we are not there yet. But in the most relevant example, namely in the, uh, to come back to my initial scenario, where uh, there are attacks against that, that potentially violate obligations which protect individual interests of states, for instance, the interest not to be interfered with in their domain reserve, not to uh, allow interventions from outside. International law does not permit collective countermeasures, and it would require further development of international law to include this possibility, but this is a long way requiring lots of state practice and opinion. This concludes my um, brief observations, and I thank you for your attention and look forward to the questions. Great. Thank you, Professor Raguski. Uh, thank you all for your remarks. Uh, we'll now move to the Q&A portion of the panel. For our panelists, I'll ask that you just turn on your videos and unmute your microphones. And uh, I'll also uh, reiterate uh, what was in the chat log. I'd encourage participants to put their questions in the Q&A box and upload those questions that you're interested in. Uh, so while we wrote, wait for those to roll in and get upvoted, I'll start with a question that I was uh, particularly interested in hearing Professor Jensen respond to. Um, this is from Mike Sinclair. Uh, acting by permission where possible, but in action where not. It's a, on your last slide. Uh, do you layer in an unwilling or unable analysis here, or is it pure unilateralism? Well, I, I, thank you for that great question, and thanks again to the organizers. This, this has been a fantastic two days. Uh, I hope that, uh, that I don't ruin it here at the end. Uh, I hesitate to discuss unable and unwilling in the presence of Ashley Deeks, who is like the world-renowned guru on this issue. Uh, so Ashley, feel free to jump in and correct me at any moment. Uh, but, uh, but I view uh, the, uh, the unable and unwilling really to be used in the self-defense idea and, and it's mostly used as a self-defense notion. Certainly the, the framework agreement produced by the Obama administration in 2016 supports this idea. Um, so the, the, one of the interesting things about this is that in this case, uh, I don't think the US uh, might be using unable and unwilling by analogy, but it's not using it in a self-defense mode. It's using it in a much more proactive mode. So even though you could argue that the principles as laid out in current US practice um, seem to in to embrace this unable or unwilling uh, procedure or view, it's not doing it in a self-defense mode. Instead, it's doing it in a proactive way to kind of deter as a deterrence issue. And that, that seems to me to be uh, a little bit unique than the way we ha have normally used unable or unwilling in the past. I immediately pass it to Ashley for her comments. Go, Ashley. Uh, thanks, Eric. Um, I'll make a pitch for international law studies here. I wrote a 2013 piece through them on uh, the geography of cyber conflict that asked this question. But I, Eric's exactly right. I asked it in the context of self-defense, thinking about unwilling or unable as a, as a sub-inquiry on the necessity question after you suffer an armed attack. Um, but I tend to agree with Eric that it may be that the US government is using the concept as a matter of policy um, and attaching it to its defend forward concept. Um, it has long said that it's sensitive to the sovereignty of other states, uh, whether sovereignty is, is a, a rule or a, a principle. And I think that's a way to, um, to express concern for other states' sovereignty, um, trying to get their consent, um, maybe even thinking about things like uh, pre-consent agreements that say, look, we, met, we know operations might happen within your territory, um, if you're willing, we can ride to the rescue. Um, that, of course, implicates the, uh, the question about collective countermeasures if we're talking about an activity below the use of force. 
Great. Uh, thank you. So I'm going to try to give each of you a turn in the hot seat. So uh, next we'll go to uh, Professor Roguski. This is a question from Jeff Biller. Uh, given the reports on malicious cyber operations related to development of the COVID, COVID vaccine, might this be an excellent opportunity to consider third-party responses against ergo omnis interests? Yes, uh, thank you very much for this excellent question. And of course, this is uh, indeed you know, the, the, the avenue that I was trying to hint at. The problem, of course, that we see here is, well, which ergo omnis obligation has been violated? So if we take a look at, at stateside obligations, uh, we would ask, well, uh, has this been an intervention uh, into the internal affairs of a state? Well, even if it has been, does the norm against intervention constitute an ergo omnis obligation? I would say probably not. And the same would be with, with sovereignty, uh, taking aside the, the, the discussions about whether sovereignty applies in cyberspace or not. So the only candidate that I can think of, and I have been giving this some thought, would be if we say that we um, um, employ collective countermeasures in order to protect a collective interest under human rights, namely the right to health. Uh, because then we could say that the uh, ICESCR, which contains the, the right to health, it is an ergo or creates ergo omnis partis obligations. And in order to enforce those obligations, then states that are not affected would be uh, entitled to, collect, to take collective uh, countermeasures. However, one, one note uh, to finish on. Of course, we only need collective countermeasures or only need to talk about collective countermeasures if we as the acting state are not ourselves injured. So if a cyber attack has also affected our ability uh, to, to, to do COVID-19 research and so forth, then we would be entitled to act as a directly injured state. And there, then we would not need those collective countermeasures construction. So on that point, um, Mike Seclair has another question. And and so I'll just uh, give it to you, Professor Roguski, because we're still on you. Does international law allow for collective countermeasures when the attack state requests the assistance of a third party in doing those? Uh, well, there is nothing in, in the Articles on State Responsibility that would, would speak to, to such an analogy to, uh, to collective self-defense. Uh, so basically, the, the third state instituting collective countermeasures would need uh, to, 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 have, to act in uh, furtherance of a collective interest. Uh, and not, you know, just acting on, on uh, uh, to help the, the injured state. Uh, here again, we can think of many scenarios. For instance, well, what does it mean to, to, to help? So all actions that themselves do not violate a norm by which the acting state, the, the third state, would be bound are permitted under international law. So for instance, a couple of days ago, US Cyber Command has uh, issued uh, a statement where it said that uh, it has conducted hand forward operations uh, together with Estonia, within Estonian network. And so this presumably was uh, requested by the Estonians. And this is not a countermeasure situation because this is limited to, to Estonian networks. So the only question is if Cyber Command together with the Estonians were to go to Russian networks, because uh, Russian, the, the Russian actors or any other state actor has intervened in that state requesting help, then we would need to, to, to find a construct to justify uh, this action on behalf of a third state. But simply a request by the third state would not be sufficient. Can I just add to that? I mean, I thought that that example of Russia and Estonia was really great because um, how a country thinks about sovereignty is a huge piece of that, right? Because if, if a country doesn't recognize a violation of sovereignty as an unlawful act under international law, then that also would not be a countermeasure. Or if the method by which they were engaging on another state's uh, infrastructure wasn't unlawful, then they would not consider themselves as uh, being involved in a countermeasure. It would be retorsion or some other thing, right? So, so that Again, we come back to that piece that Roy Schondorf talked about this morning, so important and, and states, I mean, I think we're finding a, a real re varied reflection from states on that topic. Great, thank you so much. Um, Professor Deeks, I was gonna ask this question, this is uh, sort of a, 
hybrid of a question I had, so I'm glad uh, I get to ask it through another person. Uh, Posnansky, Michael Posnansky has this question. Uh, what do you see as the trade-offs associated with President Trump's 2018 decision to give more latitude to certain entities to conduct offensive cyber operations, uh, especially if President-elect Biden continues this policy? How should we weigh the core benefits, for example, acting more nimbly and responsibly against the potential drawbacks for example, less oversight risks of ex uh, escalation. Uh, and my particular question was similar, especially if we're trying to gain the benefits of autonomy, uh, the speed at which these, these um, you know, machines can make the decision, will this potential uh, oversight or even potential um, intervention by the legislature cause delay and essentially lose those potential benefits? Yeah, great. So, um, so that's a fantastic question. And, um, Part of the answer, I think, is uh, there's an empirical aspect to the answer that I don't know. Uh, and that is uh, what exactly has happened since 2018 uh, in reliance on this new latitude? And uh, what do we think objectively about whether it has been good or bad? And it may well be that the Defense Department is, uh, is very happy about it and could be that the State Department's happy about it, but it might also be that the State Department feels as though that was a uh, a mistake. So, um, so I, I need a little bit more empirical information to, to know how to think that through, but I think it's exactly the right question. So I'm not advocating that we want to bog down policies just for the sake of having sort of slow process. Um, but I do think, you know, the State Department, for example, has long been a really important player within the United States in interpreting international law. Uh, and I would hate to see uh, them get cut out of that loop entirely on issues that are almost certainly going to implicate international law. Um, and if you just have a single agency uh, thinking about these issues, then we might think about um, David Posen wrote a piece about um, deep secrecy. And he thinks about deep secrets as being ones that few people know and only few types of people know. Uh, and by introducing the State Department and the Justice Department and so on, you are making it a little bit less of a deep secret, even though it remains a classified operation. And so I think it's healthy to keep that um, not entirely within a single agency. Um, but to answer um, the Colonel's question too, I think a lot of this gets done at the front end, right? That it's not that you wanna hold up each operation by bringing it back to the group, but you need to have hard and I think intense conversations up front that play out how different things could, could work and maybe you know, collectively agree on the rules of the road uh, for many of the situations you're gonna encounter, but do it at the front end so you don't slow down and lose the advantage of the autonomy at the, at the tail end. Fair enough, thank you so much, Professor Deeks. Uh, Professor Jensen, uh, one question I had for you that I, I wanted you to expand on mainly because I, I really liked it. And so I wanted to hear your full explanation is you mentioned um, to not, uh, not it's, you should, we should operate not with gloves off, but with the use of gloves. I was hoping you could expand on that. Yeah, well, so I mean, this this is probably not a great uh, way to pose this in an international audience, but uh, we have this saying in the United States that, uh, that you know, we're going gloves off, which means the rules kind of don't apply anymore, right? We're, we're just fighting. Um, and, and I don't, I certainly don't think that this U.S. practice has gotten us there. We, we still are bound by rules and, and the United States government is heavily legally committed. Uh, they, they want, you know, when the government takes actions, they, uh, they rely heavily on what's lawful. Um, but I do think what these uh, instances of U.S. practice say is um, you're not just going to stand back and take it, right? You're going to actually put the gloves on and engage in the fight. And, the, you know, the, the 2019 NDAA particularly sets up some pretty specific authorities and permissions, and not just permissions, but in some senses, um, you know, Congress is expressing the will of Congress and telling DOD to take actions and to do certain things. And to me, that is a, a much more aggressive approach, as, as referred to in the last question. Um, that's a much more aggressive approach. And, and I, for one, will be interested to see if uh, President-elect Biden continues that, uh, that, you know, that method. And I think that will give us some insight into Ashley's question about the empirics. I, you know, he's he and his new administration are going to look at that. They're going to look at the empirics. And I think that that will be an indication to us if they continue this approach, that those empirics have, in fact, worked to the United States national security benefit. Thank you so much. And so well, it looks like we have time for one final question. Um, 
And so uh, I think, you, Professor Deeks, you mentioned this. I, I think you answered it, but I want to make sure that we, we give, it to, give it its due. Uh, Peter Margulis uh, says, is the view of autonomy as a black box an abiding concern, or can we address it through explainable AI? Um, great. Hi, Peter. Um, thanks for the question. So, um, of course, I, one of the reasons this matters, uh, including for legislatures, is whether you can audit after the fact uh, why a system made the choices it did and, um, and Congress could help the executive take remedial steps if uh, we end up in a place that we don't wanna be, an unintended escalation, for example. Um, so again, here, I mean, I think this is also an empirical question. There's been a lot of attention paid to the problem of uh, the black box nature of machine learning and deep neural nets uh, and a lot of different uh, 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 forms that explainable AI can take. Some people worry about uh, making it explainable because you lose, uh, you degrade the quality of the system, the very thing you're trying to use the system for. Um, but I do, I, I'm relatively optimistic that there are um, going to be some helpful solutions to this. And from what I understand in conversations with the military, they too are really interested in making sure that they understand why the system is making certain recommendations and taking certain steps and not just saying, you know, go off and, and uh, we trust it entirely. So I think that incentive will also enhance uh, the work of computer scientists to, to drive towards a more explainable AI. Great, thank you. And, and so I will ask, I, I, I realize I'm going over time, but I wanna ask one final question to any of the panelists. Uh, this is from my colleague, Jeff Biller, who asks, have we seen suggestions that defending forward could be applied on behalf of allied states? Well, I guess I can take that on first and just say, um, you know, this goes back to some extent to the collective countermeasures discussion that we had. Um, as long as you don't, depending on your view of sovereignty, and as long as you either do or don't view this as unlawful, therefore it can be a countermeasure. Certainly there, uh, as, as I noted on my slide, there are lots of opportunities now where the United States is acting in conjunction with allies. So to the extent that that is the answer to Jeff's question, uh, I mean, that's, that's right. We're, we're doing that all the time. We're doing it more often. And, uh, and, and especially with people who have like-minded views on this application international law. All right. Well, great. Uh, I want to thank each and every one of you, uh, each of the panelists. Uh, very interesting, very fascinating topic. Thank you for your remarks, for your time, and from the questions. I'll turn it back over to the uh, Stockton Center for, I believe, closing remarks. Great. Well, thank you to all the panelists there. I think it's fitting that having just discussed um, the evolving nature of, of state practice and cyber operations, uh, we finished there having started the day with the remarks um, from Israel in terms of, uh, of state practice there. So thanks again to all the speakers from today for an excellent day uh, focused on cyber operations. Tomorrow, we will reconvene at 1100 hours Eastern Standard Time. And for everyone who has joined today, is interested in cyber operations. Um, the opening keynote by Doug Burnett is on submarine cable security and international law. And given the extent to which such cables underpin cyber operations and capabilities, um, hopefully you'll be able to join us there. So I'll leave it there and we'll see you tomorrow. <laughs>